It's rollback time, people. What is rollback? Rollback is the best conversations from the pre-video audio only days of the podcast brought to you right here on YouTube for the very first time. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because these conversations are fantastic. They're also evergreen. They're very worthy of your attention. And our story today, our rollback today is one of the most inspiring in the history of this show. And it's a conversation with Charlie Ingle. As an alcoholic and crack addict living out of his car, it took gunshots in his Toyota 4Runner and the birth of his son in 1992 in order to prompt Charlie to seek sobriety. And for Solace, during those early years of achieving a foundation of sobriety, Charlie turned to running, which becomes his salvation. Charlie then goes on to clock a handful of quite impressive top 10 finishes at a slew of prestigious races and accomplished an absolutely astonishing 111 day, 4,500 mile run all the way across the Sahara Desert. Life was good for Charlie until that is a federal conviction for mortgage fraud in 2010 that ends up sending Charlie to a West Virginia federal prison for 16 months. It's an incredible story. Charlie is one of a kind. He's a world-class talker. He's a master storyteller. This is a guy who's run across deserts. He's summited ice-covered volcanoes. He's swam with crocodiles. He's overcome crack addiction, even survived a stint in federal prison. And along the way, even through the lowest of lows, He's maintained this incredibly positive outlook on life. He's also a model of service, helping countless people who struggle with addiction achieve sobriety. So here it is from episode 67, recorded all the way back from January of 2014, my conversation with the incredible Charlie Engel. How are you doing? I'm doing... <laughs> I'm doing great. There's a lot going on right now. There is, man. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to swing by the house on your way north. Well, based on this beautiful setting right here, you can ask me to swing by anytime you like. Right. It's cool. We're sitting in the uh, in the garage. It's got to be like 74 degrees out or something like that. We have the door rolled up, which is why you can hear the leaf blower guy or whatever's going on. Yeah, I think it's 74 but, uh, in North Carolina too right now. Negative so. 74, right. <laughs> maybe, you know. Beautiful day here. I know the rest of the world is is gripped in a polar vortex, but we're pretty lucky here. I feel bad for them right now, but I'm I'm gonna let that go just yeah. for the minute and just enjoy where I am. Right. Be, be present, Charlie. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait, have you, have you been talking to Astasiana back there? Because uh, being present has not been easy for me lately. It's not my default, but I've been no. told that it's a better way to live that way. Yeah, I, I hear that too. I'm, I'm gonna try it sometime. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're getting married. I am. I'm getting married in, in three days. Uh -huh. So uh, a Saturday up in Big Sur to beautiful woman, Astasiana Hatcher, yes. sitting over here sitting behind, behind me. you. I can verify that she's quite lovely. I'm just really glad that she hasn't gotten a chance to speak to all that many people who know me up right. till now. That's and why you're, uh, you're racing to marry her as, as soon as possible right. before I'm she finds out. Trying to keep things isolated. <laughs> yeah, all right. Good, man. And uh, there's, you know, there's so much to talk about. I, I just tweeted out that we were going to sit down and talk. And, and I'm just thinking there's so many things I want to talk to you about. We could be here all day. You know, I mean, so many points of interest and, and relatability from the addiction story, the recovery story, the ultra running, um, you know, the epic sort of uh, adventures that you have in the works right now. I mean, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. But I, w I guess what I'd like to start with is what's... Uh, What's, a, what's about to happen? You're about to embark on this cross-country run, this attempt to, to break, the, uh, break the world record for fastest guy to run across the United States. So let's talk about that a little bit. Great. Yeah, it's, um, it, I'm calling it Run to Boston, and it's because I'm running to Boston. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's a very creative you title, know, Charlie. It's the way I work. So yeah. No, but I'm uh, along with uh, a good friend of mine, Andre Kylik. Uh, we are going to begin at the LA Marathon 
when the gun goes off and, mm-hmm. and run the marathon in LA. Unfortunately, it goes. That's March second. March ninth. March ninth. Okay. Yeah. And unfortunately, it goes uh, east to west. <laughs> You're gonna have to double back, <laughs> which is really annoying. <laughs> I mean, it seems like such a small amount of of distance, but. Uh, it goes yeah, well. It if goes you east if west, you miss so. breaking this world record by four hours mm, or so, then that would be we bad. Can point our finger at that, right? That would be bad. Yeah. But we need the mileage anyway, so it's actually okay. So we'll start there, run to Santa Monica, and and symbolically, you know, be at the coast right there, and then turn around and head back when everybody mm-hmm. else is enjoying their their beer and bagels and continue running that day andre is actually uh andre krajlik it's actually kylik kylik Uh yeah and andre uh, i wrote about him several months ago in runner's world i did a feature for runner's world about andre Uh, he and i met in brazil just a year ago doing the brazil 135 Mm -hmm. sort of a badwater sister event over there and i come across this guy 20 miles into the race who's in a wheelchair and he's going up this incredibly steep climb. And I'm like, I'm seeing him like I'm seeing a, I don't know, some sort of, you know, ghost out in the middle of the, of the jungle. I get closer and, and indeed he is in a wheelchair. So he's crazy. like, it's like an off-road <clears throat> wheelchair? Exactly. He's put off-road wheels on this somewhat standard racing style wheelchair, a little more upright than uh-huh. the ones you see like at the Boston Marathon. And he's going up this hill. He's actually got a, a guy with him, a crew member, who has a knee in his back. So he's not helping him at all, but he's making sure that when he rolls forward six inches, that he right. doesn't roll back Yeah, I was going to ask if there's some kind of braking mechanism there's not. to prevent you from going backwards. There's not. He, wow. needs, he needs to work on that. But uh-huh. uh, And I, I come up and I speak to him for just a second, and I continue on up the, the mountain. And I'm, I'm with a, a friend of mine, Chris Roman, we're running next to each other, and, and Tony Portera, two guys who've done Badwater before many times. And, uh, and I will freely admit, I turned and looked at them, and I said, there is no way in hell that that guy He's is going to make it, it to the finish line. It uh, wasn't a... How many miles uh, in were you? Yeah, we're like 20 miles in. Oh, right. And I know what's coming. We, we hit these jungle portions where there were muddy single track, you know, I mean, not the kind of thing you can be in any sort of chair. Right. Well, he got out of his chair, tethered the wheelchair uh, to a, you know, to a tether, literally went on the ground. He'd go 50 feet up, pull the wheelchair up behind him, go another 50 feet, pull it up. Oh, anyway, God. 62 hours later, he finishes this race. Oh. And I went and asked him if he would mind if I you know, pitched a story to Runner's World about him. Mm-hmm. And he said, sure. And I did. And they loved the idea. And he was the he was the first in a series of stories that I'm doing called Hard One Wisdom, mm-hmm. where most of the article is really their own words, quotes from them. But Andre and I started talking about, uh, I told him, I said, you know, something I really like to do is to take another shot. Because in 2008, I tried to break this same record. I right. said, so I'd like to take another shot at the transcontinental record. Would you be interested? I just asked mm-hmm. him if he'd be interested in doing it. Because I thought it might be cool for, you know, for a guy uh, in his position to, to take a shot at that record, too. He calls me back a couple of days later, and he's the one who said, hey, I was, I was just looking at the calendar. And did you know that the LA marathon and the Boston marathon are 44 days apart uh-huh. this year. And I'm like, wow, that sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Well, the thing about that too, is that at least the, uh, the, the, the cross country running record is what is it? 46 days. It it's is. close to that. Right. But Correct. the, the cross country wheelchair record is like 71 yeah. days or something like that. It, so he's looking at, Oh yeah, I'm going to cut this in half. Yeah. I don't want to be overconfident yeah. on his part because he wouldn't like it. But I mean, I think, no, well, yes, pun intended. The wheels would have to come off for him to not, to break. not break it, right? Because he's just, you know, he won the he won Kona and the mm-hmm. uh, hand cycle division a couple of years ago. Not this past year, but the year before. And he's just a he's a tough guy, you know. And mm-hmm. he is um, his story is amazing. You know, he lost uh, he lost his legs. Uh, wasn't a wasn't born that way and didn't didn't fight in any wars, you know, had a a crazy, almost unexplainable accident in Prague. Mm-hmm. Uh, went out with some friends and had a few cocktails and 
went his own separate way later that night and ended up falling off a plane train platform onto the tracks and got run over by five oh subway God. cars and you know it took one of his legs all the way up to the hip and the other one mid femur and broke every rib on one side and i mean there's absolutely no no logical reason that that he should still be alive after that accident mm -hmm. Uh, but he, you know, he's gone on to not just live a full life, but a, a you know, a really a fully functional or more than functional life. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have some, you know, company like him. It's very, it's very humbling. And I think again, that he'll, he's actually going to attempt this record in a, on a basically stock wheelchair, like a, like a street wheelchair. As You're kidding, not to, not with the zip wheels on it and the whole no, thing? No, Why is that? Why is he well, handicapping himself further? I think it's a message in a way. I mean, he wants to he, he wants to say, because these, these racing wheelchairs are really expensive. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of folks out there who are in wheelchairs. And the idea that you can't have exercise or that you can't be active because of that is something that he feels very strongly is not the case. And mm -hmm. so... You know, he'll have to make some modifications and it may not be, you know, fully stock, but it will certainly be as close to it as he can make it. Wow, that's amazing. And just, you know, in case people are, are not comprehending what we're talking about here, the intention is to, you're basically going to have to cover about 70 miles every single day in order to cross the country in 44 days. And that's running or wheelchairing, <laughs> rolling. 70 miles every single day without any rest day. So how do you even begin to approach that, not just physically, but mentally? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Those people that know me know that the mental part of it is, uh, that that is the big question, and it may just be that I, I don't have enough going on up there to really... I think about it. But. Right. I mean, to backtrack, when you when you ran across the Sahara, that was, what, 111 days or something like that, right? So you've gone m more days, but that was a, around 40-some-odd miles a day, right? It so was, was going to be a record. If we could make it all the way across, which, mm -hmm. of course, we did, it was going it. to be a record. Whether it took, you know, 75 days or 150 days, it would be a record. So mm -hmm. when the inevitable logistical or physical problems came up, they didn't really curtail the possibility of the record. The mm -hmm. only thing that would do that would be if, you know, if Libya hadn't let us right. into Libya. In this case, and if we had a bad day in Africa, we could, in fact, I could call it, you know, a short day. I could say, okay, mm -hmm. today we're going to do 40 miles instead of 50 or whatever. And that's just not the case with Run to Boston. Mm -hmm. You know, we... we we have to cover 70 miles every day. And I, I made a lot of mistakes in 2008. When you're, you and Marshall were Correct. doing that run across the U.S. Yeah, I just, it was, you know, one thing is I spent a ridiculous amount of time before that expedition. I mean, for six months, having to deal with almost every aspect of the production. There was a film, there mm -hmm. was, you know, me dealing with my own training and all of that. And I, I really just didn't. We had a great production company, uh, Next Productions, that was doing the production of the film, and they were awesome. Um, but I was really left alone for all the rest of it. Uh, this time I have a, a partner in Andre who is equal mm -hmm. in his approach to the way we're doing this, mm -hmm. and he is taking on you know a lot of the planning and logistical tasks. And uh, in 2008, I was left to do those myself. And and I also overtrained. I made the mistake that I tell right. other people don't do all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I was just well. It's because it, it it has to be so daunting and and so fear provoking that you almost can't help yourself from yeah. overtraining. I need to run five hundred miles a week <laughs> when I'm crossing <laughs> yeah. the country. Five hundred miles a week, and uh -huh. that's for six weeks in a row. And that is an absurd. If I actually think about that. Uh, I would recognize that it's simply, you know, not possible. I mean, and, and so it's that, back to the moment, back it's to back being, to the moment, being in the present moment and it, being in the now. I mean, we had an interesting conversation on the phone the other week where you were talking a little bit about this and you were saying, you know, in, in sort of reflecting back upon how you overtrained last time and, and this understanding based on your experience that 
that the body will adapt. You just have to get through the first two weeks, and then the body almost sort of says, okay, I get what's going on You're now. trying to you kill me. You kind of adjust, but you've got to take those first couple of weeks really easy and cautiously. And yeah. And, and the first time I was absolutely a, uh, a slave to the schedule. Like if it said we had to run 70 that day, I ran mm-hmm. 70. When had I stopped at 60, I might have actually salvaged a decent night's sleep and, and whatever. I just wasn't willing to, to change it. This time, would I love to run 70 on all those first days? Absolutely, because... Mm-hmm. Any day I don't run 70 is another day I've got to run farther than 70. Mm -hmm. But the reality is if I destroy myself in the first two weeks, then it's a moot point. It's done. It doesn't matter what happens after that. So I've been working actually with Jeff Galloway. He's been kind enough to help me with some training programs that initially made no sense to me at all because Jeff believes very strongly in uh, sort of a run walk approach when Mm -hmm. he's training people for marathons. Mm -hmm. And when I reached out to him to say, Hey, here's what I'm doing. You know, can you help me figure out a way where I can actually cover 70 miles a day in 15 hours or less get, uh, you know, some time to eat, get a quick massage and hopefully get a minimum of seven hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. Can you help me? And he absolutely stepped up and said that he thought he had a plan for me and, and he has given that to me. I've been using it for a few weeks now and it's, it's very strange as a runner sometimes to walk you know, to right. sort of, you know, fast mm-hmm. hike, which I actually do pretty well, but to, to slow it down and realize that the goal, of course, is to get to the finish. I mean, it seems counterintuitive, and yet at the same time, it seems completely elementary. Like, if you, if you, if you just have to cover those 70 miles, you know, between when you wake up in the morning and when you go to sleep at night, it seems logical to me that the best way to do that is to incorporate walking into it. And even, you know... After I crewed bad water this past year, people were like, well, what, you know, what is it like? What kind of pace are these people running? And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, there's a lot of walking. Every time there's an incline, people are walking. They're marching. They're doing a fast-paced hike or, or what have you. So to me, it seems like that would be, of course, that's the answer to pacing yourself all the way across the U.S. Well, Badwater is a great example because when I, when I speak to audiences very often, I'll, one of the first questions I'll ask is I'll say, okay, who in here can run an 11 minute mile? Most everybody mm-hmm. in the room raises their hands. I'm yeah. like going just one mile, 11 minutes. And they're like, everybody's got their hands up. Like, okay, if you could do that, for every mile at Badwater, you would set a new course <laughs> record. Win, yeah. you no, know, you wouldn't just win. Yeah. You'd set a new course uh-huh. record. And people uh-huh. are looking around going, what? I'm like, uh-huh. yeah. I said, it's also, you know, it's like it's like running on the sun and it's it's crazy hot. And there's other things that just happen that you can't imagine would happen. But in Running America, I mean, uh, Running America back in 2008, what I learned... I tried to be proactive and account for every possible thing that could go wrong. And I think I did that to, to a certain degree, but every possible thing did go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so while I was, while I had acknowledged those things might happen, uh, I really wasn't completely prepared for what to do about it when they did Mm -hmm. this time. Like what would be an example of um, something going wrong? You know, well, the best example is three days before that run started, I actually was diagnosed with a, a staph infection called mm-hmm. MRSA. And I'd never heard of it before. I didn't even know what it was. I'm like, oh, okay, a little staph infection. I'll, I'll take some antibiotics. Uh, the doc who was with us actually said, look, you know, you really can't take antibiotics right now. First of all, they probably won't help. But if you do, they just destroy your system and you're getting ready to try to run 70 right. miles a day. So I'm not sure what I could have done any differently there other than, you know, not get in the hot tub. But, uh, you know, it, it, I I think that the, and ultimately that's what that pulled you out of the race. Well, infection. it was, and I had 20 different injuries that took place that are fairly normal. Most were overuse injuries, tendonitis, Mm -hmm. blisters. I mean, you name it, things that are fairly common, but you deal with them. And as I said before, the body has an amazing ability to adapt to stress and Mm -hmm. to overcome those things. And 
one after another these these injuries the the doc did an incredibly great job of helping me and they all went away but one you know and i had this tendonitis in the front of my right ankle and my my right foot had gone numb basically and uh and he he basically said one day look it's going to be permanent you know the nerve damage here is going to be permanent if you keep running on it Mm -hmm. and i still have three toes that are numb on that foot but you know it's it's and i i against everything inside me i made the decision you know to to stop at that point i jumped on a bike actually and rode the rest of the way across the country and and supported marshall and and was you know as good of a cheerleader as i as i could be for him and hopeful that for the project overall that he would be successful and he and he and he was he did make it so Mm -hmm. that was great but looking back on that Mm -hmm. and thinking all right here's what i'm going to do differently this time you're not going to overtrain. You're incorporating this run walk method. What are some of the other things that you're going to do a little bit differently? Well, nutritionally, I'm really going at it differently. I've always had the attitude, honestly, that calories are calories, especially during a race. Mm-hmm. And you know, my joke was in the Sahara. Even there was a time when it seemed like, you know, everyone might quit. And uh-huh. I might continue on. And I always made the joke that if I can get, you know some candy bars and a, and a camel to go with me, then I'll be fine. Let me go. You know, this time, uh, very much thanks to Estaciana, I'm, I'm looking at my nutrition a lot differently. Mm-hmm. And I'm a vegetarian and have been for many years. But this time I'm taking that more seriously and realizing that I do need to fuel my body properly for something like this mm-hmm. and not just assume that because I eat you know, 5,000 calories worth of junk food in a day that that's going to sustain me right in the long term. But actually, bad water in hundreds and some of those things, you, to a certain degree, you can get away with that. You know, you need to eat some good food, of course, and have good nutrition, mm-hmm. but you can get away with... Yeah, because you're not getting up and doing it day, d- exactly. day after day after day, but that exactly. stuff's going to add up for you. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize and you're doing a multiple day event when you're eating, you're not eating for how you're going to feel in the next hour. You're eating for the following day, yeah. you know, and you have to always be bearing that in mind, even if you're not hungry, making sure that you're on top of that stuff and you're not running into too much of a deficit. Yeah. It's not about bonking. Like I'm not worried yeah. about any given day about bonking because I'll, I'll take in enough calories hour by hour to, mm. for that not to happen. But it is, how am I going to feel later in the day and how am I going to feel tomorrow? And well, really, the answer to that is I'm going to feel like crap. Right. I mean, there's no doubt. But how do you minimize just how yeah. crappy you're going to feel? Yeah, minimizing it. and, and So uh, what are some of the foods that you're going to be relying on? Um, eating things that are, uh, for example, real bread, Ezekiel bread, and, mm-hmm. and things that, you know, as the, uh, my, my dad, of all people, said something to me today that, that was funny, uh, and he was quoting a, a nutritionist, so I can't remember his name, but... Uh, and he said, basically, if it, you know, if it won't rot, you shouldn't eat it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of the philosophy of, uh, eating things. I, I've found that when I cut dairy out almost completely a long time ago, you know, now if I, if I were to dare, I made a big mistake, uh, probably five or six months ago, there was some regular milk in the refrigerator. We were out of almond milk mm-hmm. and, you know, I used it on a bowl of cereal and it, you know, it freaked my stomach out for about two days. Yeah. And uh, I learned that, of course, uh, not only is that not right for me, but uh, it's, you know, milk is not something that we sort of naturally right. are meant to drink. We, we teach our bodies to tolerate it by mm-hmm. drinking it all the time. But it's also quite inflammatory too, and acidic. Yeah. So when you're trying to kind of repair your body as you go. Not not really the best thing to be taking in. I sure. Don't think. Well, and I am a. I think I'm a pragmatist when it comes to inflammation. I take, uh, you know, I take a fish oil supplement. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ascenta is a company that I've been using for a long time, and I think they have a really pure product. And but I'm also taking Advil. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, right. I, it's a combination of things because with the with the sheer volume of miles that we're talking about in something like this. Uh, it, it is my job as much as anything to keep inflammation down mm-hmm. to a minimum. I use Arnica regularly, mm-hmm. which is 
you know, which is great, both as a topical gel and then also as a sublingual mm -hmm. uh, pill. And that is a natural anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that those kinds of things can make uh, a huge difference. And then, for yeah. you know, look, just the obvious things, fruits and vegetables. And, you know, I do eat, uh, you know, bars of all kinds of different mm -hmm. types. And, you know, out there I'm not going to really use gels and such because it's, you know, I don't ever really need that, that yeah, instant rush. Yeah, you're not doing rush. interval training. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't need the instant rush to get over the, you know, through uh -huh. the wall. I need something that's long-term uh, sustaining. Right, like a lower glycemic version of a sugar. Absolutely. Keep Absolutely. Going. So, you know, and, and re you know what? The rest of it is mental. I mean, my friend Ray Zahab from... From running this era, you know, it's it's uh -huh. it's one of the best quotes ever that you know these things are are ninety percent mental and the other ten mm -hmm. percent's all in your head. <laughs> it's true, man. Well, I mean, it's pretty exciting. It's uh, I just I can't even wrap my brain around it. You know, it's going to be quite an adventure. Where are you at in terms of uh, sponsorship and kind of having all the uh, you know t the t's crossed and the i's dotted to have the crew all sorted out? Yeah, that's a it's a daily work in progress right now so we're only a couple of months away from the start of this yeah. expedition clock is ticking <clears throat> and we are I'm, i feel incredibly lucky uh just a few weeks ago uh, a group called the campus agency in boston actually came on board to uh, to really try to run the ship here and and bring in sponsors that made a lot of sense for this and mm -hmm. their connection of course to the city of boston and to at least tangen tangentially, the bombing, you know, from last year. I mean, this, you know, this run, many, many things are going to happen around the Boston Marathon this year uh, to both honor and acknowledge of what course. happened last year. And we certainly aren't, you know, we want to just be a respectful part of that. And the run to Boston is absolutely, though, to support Boston mm -hmm. in a general sense and, and support running i mean we you know as well as i do that uh, i'm biased of course but runners are by nature resilient and stubborn mm -hmm. and you know if somebody does something as as heinous as that was last april the response is going to be overwhelmingly to uh, to make a positive move towards you know rejecting anything mm -hmm. that would you know, dampen the spirits of an event like that, but overall also acknowledging me, people lost their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, they were permanently changed. Some of the people that survived, of course, lost, lost limbs and that affected not just right. them, but families, mm -hmm. their whole families. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, it's a critical thing for yeah. us to just acknowledge that and just say that, you, you know, weren't we're, there. Well, you weren't there. Well, I wasn't. You weren't there. Yeah. I no, I wasn't so. like everybody else or those that weren't there, you know, the news was, I, I would say that was as fast as any news has ever traveled, given the the way. It was crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> I was actually at CNN headquarters in New York City, sitting with really? a news producer friend of mine. And, you know, in the offices, they all have the TVs on, right? Mm -hmm. They're all watching TV. As a, and when it, when it happened, and I watched CNN, like, jump on the story as it was unfolding live. And it was insane how quickly they got on top of it and stuff was broadcasting live from the moment it happened to, to you know, editorializing it. Yeah. Crazy, you know, across the world. No doubt. Well, and, and you know, as it should be. I mean, yeah. they certainly they certainly spend an incredible amount of time and energy on the Kardashians. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on things that you just roll your eyes and shake yeah. your head, and it's like really. Yeah. And uh, and you know, and I am I'm biased by everything about Boston. <coughs> you know, I've been very lucky to have run Boston. You know, quite a few times in mm -hmm. the past. And one one of the things that I say, I've I run it. Uh, I think five times now over about 20 years. And so the interesting thing is, you know, 20 years ago, I was a much different person. I was newly sober. I was 20 years younger, not mm -hmm. surprisingly funny how that works. And all I cared about was going fast. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to break three hours at Boston and, you know, and I did. And like, that was my big goal. Mm -hmm. And, and then the next time I found that, 
you know, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of cute girls at Wellesley. I should stop and at least acknowledge them, you know? And, and then the next time it was like, wow, there's a bunch of kids out here that are handing out orange slices. I should take those and high five them. And so, you know, my time's more about the experience. Yeah. My time's changed. And and the point being that I changed Boston didn't change. Mm -hmm. That marathon course is exactly the same every time. And that's the beauty of it. You know, it's, it's, you know, the support of the community mm-hmm. and the attitude of the runners and just everything about it is so, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's almost an otherworldly experience. But, you know, we, of course, and, and me in this case, you know, I've changed. And, mm-hmm. and that's a cool thing to sort of acknowledge when you're running on a course like that. Yeah, and I think it's um, kind of incumbent upon someone like yourself that if you're going to undertake a race or an adventure, that it has to be about something more than you. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm going to run across the U.S. Well, other people have done that. Other people have done it faster. I'm going to try to be the fastest. But, but you know, why are you doing you know, Like, what is driving you to do? What is the undercurrent that it, that is creating this compulsion to show up for this kind of adventure and i'm sure you know there's many reasons for that internally <laughs> maybe your therapist knows yeah. a little Do bit you... about that but uh <laughs> but uh or your sponsor but uh you know but to tie it to something bigger than yourself like this cause of boston and you know you, you have to do that well you can and again my my answers change and it's not it is because i you know hopefully i i morph and change and you know i'm i'm really i like to say that these types of adventures, these long, very painful, they're, they're not things that I, I don't think they're good for me, mm-hmm. like healthy. I don't, you know, people have said, is this, you know, how do you feel about what's it doing to your body? I'm like, it can't be good for me, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm not, I'm not the one saying that it, you know, that it is. However, it is something I am compelled to do. And it is probably, not probably, it's related certainly to my addictive nature. Mm-hmm. And and certainly an obsessive personality to a degree. And my, my lifelong goal has been finding balance and marrying Astasiana, mm-hmm. who is a much more balanced person than I am, is is part of the is is part of what I think the, the growth that I've been able to experience over these last few years, where a lot of things have happened to me. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I've gone through a lot and. Uh, well, I'm fond of saying, because I believe it so deeply, that just because something seems impossible doesn't mean I'm not supposed to try it. Mm-hmm. Because the likelihood of completing this run to Boston and breaking this record, it's not like I'm sitting here saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not about playing the, you know, the mental game we sometimes do with ourselves where we feel like confidence is going to overcome it. This is too, it's too big. It's too difficult for that. And, and so humbly I say that I am going to give it my best shot and that uh, I hope that I learn some more things about myself along the way and that I can also acknowledge some positive things both in Boston and, and in other ways and about sobriety. And we've got some great charitable partners that are coming on board and, and really just make it a, you know, making an experience that somehow helps me get along further and, and be, you know, be better in general. Mm -hmm. Again, back to this theme of showing up and being in the moment, right? I don't want to be afraid. I am afraid of it. You know, I'm, I am, you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that three days into this thing, I say I shouldn't even pick a day because that makes me nervous. (laughs) Some, you know, a few days into this thing that like, you know, I'm going to, something's going to happen and I can't go on. And it's like, I, I tend to, um, my, my successes have been pretty, uh, broadly watched and, and my, my failures, uh, both as a human being and, and as an athlete have also been pretty, uh, pretty easily viewed by anyone that wants to take the time. And yeah, but you're like, uh, it's almost <clears throat> like uh, in the world according to Garp when the airplane crashes into the house and he says, I'll buy it. It's pre-disaster, <laughs> right? It's never going to happen again. So you've had these epic fails. <laughs> you've had, you've experienced, you know, incredible lows in your life. So the idea of showing up and running across the country and not making it, it's like, eh. Yeah. You know, like I was in jail. You know, yeah. I, was a, I was a crack addict. Like, yeah. what is that? Who cares? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, is that water off your back? I mean, of course you're afraid and you want to succeed, but 
you know, in terms of perspective and proportion. Well, we all think that everyone's watching us too, you know, like, yeah. like that somehow what we're doing, even if you're just a, you know, <laughs> yes, no matter. That's a self-obsession right. of the alcoholic mind. <laughs> right. you know? Everybody in the world yeah. cares about whether or not I succeed at this. Yeah. And, and the reality is. And at the same time, everybody hates me. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that may be true, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's certainly not true that every, you know, nobody else's life is like hanging on whether or not I complete <laughs> yeah. this thing. And and that reality in some ways is very um, it's refreshing liberating. and liberating. Yeah, because I'm gonna, you know, yeah, I I this crazy thing happened a couple of years ago, and I end up in prison. And initially, there was a part of me that thought, you know, wow, this is, you know, yeah, I think everybody, you know, certainly anyone who knew me or knew of me at that point seemed to know that this thing had happened to me. Mm-hmm. But then very quickly, the well, reality, it was uh, like giant articles in the New York yeah. Times about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in a way, that was cool. I didn't have to be the one to step up and say, defend yourself. This yeah. was, yeah, wrong or right. I, mm-hmm. I let other people do it. And, and I'm happy to say that, you know, they did it. They did it well. You know, there's always going to be, it, it's really funny that, you know, because running the Sahara is such an interesting movie and it's, 500 hours of film boiled down to 90 minutes of documentary. So mm-hmm. people who see that film have a tendency to think that, that they know me like yeah. that is me. Like every, if I yelled at someone or you, if they, I, it was definitely edited so that you come off on the dickish. No doubt. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I don't deny that I am sometimes, yeah. you know I mean? The, the thing is that I think it's fair to say that I have my, you know, I have my moments. I'll be the first one to say uh-huh. I am. I am not an easy person to, you know, to be around. Sometimes I'm not fair. I'm I'm driven uh, in ways that are occasionally embarrassing to me, but certainly as a you know as a human being that I you know I say things I wish mm-hmm. I hadn't said and uh, you know and all that. But I I think that through recovery and and through a lot of things I'm I'm pretty quick also to apologize for my shortcomings but not for being who I am Mm -hmm. you know this is this is the this is the package that there is and it makes me really good at a few things and it it, I suck at some other things and uh you know it was it was very refreshing though as it as a strange uh, way to put it to be in prison and knowing seeing so many things being written and printed and talked mm-hmm. about out there about how you know how unfair it was and how wrong mm-hmm. it was and and uh you know I didn't need to say a thing right <clears throat> and I want to get into into that into that part of the story a little bit um but to kind of backtrack I mean I first the first time I heard an interview with you it must have been like 2007 maybe um it was before I'd ever done any of this stuff any of the ultraman kind of things and it i think it was it was either bob babbitt or it was you know that guy kevin at endurance planet mm-hmm. maybe i'm not yeah, sure yeah. and and uh yeah. the question was something like you must get this all the time that you know all this the, the ultra running and all of that is just you've just transferred your addiction onto your running and you know what do you say to somebody who who uh who accuses you of that. And you had a really, I don't know if you remember, but you had a really fascinating answer to that question that really stuck with me because it's something that I struggle with. And and I feel that same question all the time. Do you remember what you said? I know what I would say now. So no, I don't remember what I would say. I'd be interested to hear what you say. What I would say now is, you know, is that drugs and alcohol absolutely masked everything that I ever was, uh, no matter what that was, it was a, it was a mask. It was my way of hiding from anything and running and adventure actually shines this huge bright light on exactly who I am. You know, Mm -hmm. there's no, there's no, uh, there's no way to mask that when you're running a hundred miles, eventually during a hundred miles, you will become mm-hmm. exactly who you are, mm-hmm. you know, for better or for worse. That's, that's not always the, the best thing. So, but I mean, my, my feeling today anyway, is, is that, that I say something more brilliant back then? No, I think it was, it was pretty much around, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was essentially thematically consistent with that, which is that, um, 
you know, when you're using drugs and alcohol, you are, you're hiding from the world, you're afraid, you're, you're cowering. And when you're running and embracing these incredible adventures, you're saying yes to life and you are inviting challenge and inviting community and inviting, um, you know, inviting, uh, the opportunity to confront and walk through fear into your life. You know, and acknowledging imperfection. I mean, Mm. I'm, I'm as imperfect as any person you'll ever meet, but I, I know that through, through running and through scraping away those outer layers that we pretty much all wear all day, every day, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, running, once you get to the, you know, whatever it is relatively for each person, you know it when you see it, you know, Mm -hmm. because I don't care if you're just running five miles, you know, for someone who's never run five miles before, by the time they've run three miles, they're thinking, you know, they're, they're, they are raw. They're that raw Uh human being. And that's what I want. I want to be that raw person and see what's, you know, what's down there and drugs and alcohol did nothing, but of course, hide all of all of that and made it impossible to ever have an actual real emotion. Mm -hmm. And, and with running, my emotions are sometimes too, (laughs) too real, but I would rather have that any day. But also acknowledging, not trying to deny the fact that there's this addictive compulsive nature within you that, that certainly is attracted to doing that and is, you know, drives you towards that and allows you in many ways to be able to, not just entertain the idea of, of these feats, but actually see them through, you know, it's like, of course, like if somebody says, well, you just transferred your addictions. Well, it's like, well, yeah, you know, yeah. In many ways that's true. I can't say no to that, but, but it's, it's an, it's a way to, um, access the best part of who you are by finding out exactly who you are. I agree completely. But, but here's another funny, I mean, people who tend to be that critical, and tend to, you know, when they, when someone says to me, haven't you just transferred? I usually take that as a criticism. I don't mm-hmm. usually take it as a comment. I usually hear them saying something is wrong with you. Yeah. And there may very well be, but I don't necessarily <laughs> appreciate them saying it. And, and, and the thing is, you know, it does tend to come very often from people who maybe haven't gone out there and pushed themselves to their limit, whatever that might be. And maybe they're just exploring and trying to figure out if they should. Maybe it makes them feel better to acknowledge, you know, someone that else's you, shortcomings. You, or that you, you're doing this only because you have a disease. Exactly. Yeah. Something's clearly wrong with you. And I, again, I, I say to them, you are probably right. But here's, a, you know, here's another funny example there, I think. You know how... You you touched on why I like do these things, and and one of the other reasons why is simply because my my hope is that I do in fact become that I become better that, that without making myself better I certainly don't have the capability of ever truly helping someone else, mm-hmm. and that's in running and recovery and any other part of my life. If I'm not if I'm focused on other people all the time. Mm-hmm how does that make, you know, that can't necessarily make me better. I can do both things in conjunction, but I use the example of like most of my big runs, I've had some cause attached water for Africa. You know, I played a part in raising $6 million to Mm -hmm. build wells. And I'm, I'm eminently proud of that. You know, what I helped to build there grew into water.org, which Mm -hmm. is, Matt Damon and my friend Gary White. Mm -hmm. And I introduced the two of them. I Mm -hmm. fought to bring them together. In fact, when, when they actually, you know, sort of refused to work together for a Mm -hmm. while and I worked and I'm, I'm proud of that, you know, with running America the first time in 2008, it was, you know, the United way and some other nonprofits. And I, and I love attaching something because if I'm going to do something, why not try to also do some good, but I'm also honest enough to say that I'm selfish. You know, I'm really doing this as much as anything because I, as a human being, want to see if I can do it. Mm -hmm. And what happens I see very often is that people run for charity all the time and and I are for nonprofits and such. And I I totally, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of that. I admire it and all of that. But here's the, here's the conversation I hear in offices. Like the runner is in the office there where they work. Mm -hmm. And the runner's telling other people, you know, yeah, I'm going to run this marathon. And people are looking at him who are non-runners and saying, 
why would you, I don't even drive my car that mm-hmm. far. That old say, well, you know, why would you do something like that? And that person is then pinned into a corner and they say, well, I'm doing it for <laughs> cancer or diabetes or it's for... It's a disingenuous response because it's not really right. true. I mean, it's great that they're raising money for that and they're trying to make it some, somewhat about something other than themselves. But yeah, it's not, there, there is a level of, you know, not being completely frank well, it's about okay. the motivations. It's okay to do mm-hmm. something just because you want to see if you can do it. Right. And I would hope that anybody who ever toes the line of a marathon or an ultra or, or any race for that matter is at least partially driven by this desire to see how good they can be mm-hmm. and what they can accomplish. And at the same time, if they can, absolutely, if they can honor something that's important to them or raise money for it or whatever it is they might do, I... I I completely support that, but I won't, I'm, I'm always telling people, try to acknowledge the fact that you're accomplishing something big, and you should be proud of that just for you, and, and not right, necessarily... Right, to feel comfortable saying, I'm doing it because I want to see if I can do it. Yeah, I'm a runner, and I want to yeah. see if I can run 26 miles in X time, or just right. if I can survive mm-hmm. it and not throw up on my shoes, or you know, <laughs> whatever it might be. Throwing up on your shoes, there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's not. Yeah. I think it's a, you know, I think... <laughs> I think we're people are biased against those of us that that vomit on our shoes regularly. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's step it back. I mean, for people that aren't familiar with your story, um, and in the show notes, I'll do an introduction to this interview and all of that. And and I'll in the sh- in the show notes on the website, I'll put links up to some of the articles. Um, but I do want to hear. I do want to get into a little bit of the addiction story because personally, that's so resonant with with me. Um, you know, growing up and sort of, you know, being a college kid and having your needs met and then just going left on the world, you know, like what is, what's going on? I mean, somebody would say you're a crazy person. Like what happened? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what didn't happen? Yeah. You, you know, I was, I was a pretty, uh, well, I was going to say I was a typical high school kid, but I, I probably was you a little. You kind of had hippie parents though, yeah, right? I yeah. was a little above, but I was a little above I don't want to say above average, but, you know, I, I did a lot. I, I played, you know, five sports in high school you and I like was football captain yeah, or quarterback. Right? Yeah, and I was student, student class president and, and then student body president my senior year. And I, you know, made good grades and had a good SAT and was going to a good college at UNC Chapel Hill and all, you know, I mean, I, I like wrote and produced a radio show actually in high school. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, a TV show, a closed circuit show in our high school every morning. So I mean, I was, I was up at five running. At six, I was at the radio station getting the AP wire because we uh-huh. didn't have, you know, I didn't have a BlackBerry or a or an iPhone at the time. And you know, I'm doing all these things all day every day. Well, I I get to and the UNC. world's your the world's your oyster. Oh, I'm the man, yeah. right? And I get to UNC Chapel Hill as a 17 year old freshman, and like, there's no banners that are saying "Welcome, Charlie. Mm-hmm. We're so glad you're here," you know. And uh, and it, it took me, you know, probably a, a whole couple of weeks to realize that, you know, going to a place like that with 4,000 other freshmen, I was basically average, <laughs> you know, average at best even. And there were a lot of very talented you know, athletes, students, dancers, you know, they were better looking. I, mm-hmm. I tried to reserve the fact that I was funnier than other people, but I don't know that I got that yeah. one either. But, you know, and what I found pretty quickly was that I was really good at one thing and better than everyone else, at least in my dorm, and that was drinking. Yeah, I was I was awesome. I was uh, <laughs> I was world class, and I planned on setting as many records as I could. And that was not conducive to making good grades or studying or did you do else. The, the the fraternity thing? I did ultimately and uh-huh. and again, it, it dates me a bit, but in North Carolina, where I went to school, the drinking age was eighteen yeah. for beer and wine when I went to college and as I was while I was there, uh, it actually changed to nineteen and then to twenty one but uh-huh. I managed to stay <laughs> just in front of the curve uh, in that but you know, I joined a fraternity my, my second year and certainly wasn't their fault. You know, they, you know, we would, we would party and I was, I was introduced to cocaine at that point. It was the eighties though. It was like, it was ubiquitous. It was, it was as common as, you know, marijuana like always has been or alcohol. And, 
and I, it just didn't seem, it seemed like what everyone else was doing. I, I tried it and it took very little time to realize that when I would do it, you know, I'm seeing two or three sunrises in a row Mm -hmm. without sleeping while the other guys, you know, they might do whatever, a couple of lines or they might do, they might do some and they're actually going to sleep at four o'clock in the morning and getting up and, you know, going to class or doing whatever it is, you know, they were, they were truly the definition of recreational users. Right. But there's a big difference between sort of understanding that, like kind of that clicking in and going, Oh, like I do this a little bit differently than everyone else. Um, I mean, a normal person would say, well, that's when you start to rectify this situation. But, you know, I know for myself very early on, I was like, I'm definitely an alcoholic, but I would never admit that I knew in my heart of hearts that I was because I knew that I drank differently and I have a huge scar on my leg from a lost weekend I spent at UNC in 1986. <laughs> I, was where I, I woke up at, I don't know, were you, you maybe, maybe we partied together. Were you there in eight, you were, uh, wait, were did, you I have, uh, did I hit you with an ax handle? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe you caused the scar on my leg. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but what happened to me was that that set in motion a, a, a chain of events to, protect my future right to continue to use it's like oh well hmm you know i better i better really kind of watch myself because i want to continue to be able to do this so if it gets too out of control too soon then i'm going to have to do something about it or i'm going to have somebody else is going to tell me i have to do something about it so it was all about trying to preserve your ability to continue to be able to party and and of course never being able to get that balance right or that mix right and it just continues to get worse and spiral out of control well, I went to my first AA meeting when I was 23 years old in Atlanta. Right. And I didn't get clean and sober until I was 29. So that tells mm-hmm. you something. And so the, the acknowledgement of the problem right. was there it, it, very it, early on. Yeah. Self-knowledge will avail you nothing. <laughs> yeah. and, right, exactly right. And I, <laughs> and I absolutely kept fighting it and kept, you know, of course, I changed my... Uh, my plan a thousand times, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do, you know, drugs. I'm just going to drink. I'm not going to drink liquor. I'm just going to drink beer. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever it might be, I did it. I did at least seven or eight, uh, geographical changes, which is common for addicts, you know, where I would go somewhere and I'd move to Seattle and get a new job and a new girlfriend and a, you know, life would be fantastic for six months. And then you wake up and you go, oh, shit, I brought myself <laughs> with me. I got to move again, darn it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that would, that would be what would happen is then, you know, within a year, I'd be off to some other city to, to do it better. And, of course, do it exactly the same the next time because, sure enough, there I was. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it just took what it took the last time. Yeah, the last time was uh, at least the last time up to now as we say, yeah. uh, was uh, over 21 years ago, and it was a very Because memorable. you and I are going to go, we're going to go. We're going to go re- hammered re- right re- after yeah, this. Yeah, right after we finish the podcast. <laughs> People ask me every Why year. Why wait until we're done? Let's see what we have in the cabinet. People know? ask me every year. They're yeah. like, oh, I'll tell them, yeah, it's my sobriety birthday. Like, I don't celebrate my regular birthday, but yeah. I celebrate my sobriety birthday. They're like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm going to go get shit-faced. Right. And they'll look at me like, really? I'm like, No. I'm not, but... Well, people would be amazed how many people relapse on their first year anniversary. Oh, yeah. Because only the alcoholic will think it's a good idea to celebrate a year of sobriety by getting drunk. Yeah. You know, that makes perfect sense to me. Well, clearly they've proven that they can (laughs) drink like a normal person now. So, yeah, I messed it up. I messed up, you know, jobs and and -hmm. certainly my own life and wasted a lot of time. I mean, I did my first... My first three marathons I ever did, uh, really my first four, were still when I was very unsober. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'll never forget, in fact, doing my first marathon, which was Big Sur back in 1989. And I, I mean, I didn't enter the race until about a week before the race, did essentially no training, but I'd been out doing some running and, uh, and I, just decided that this was another way. This is how I could prove. Clearly, I'm not an alcoholic or an right. addict if I can go exactly. out and do a marathon. So I enter yeah. this enter this race and I go and and I 
uh, and I do actually finish the thing in, mm-hmm. in a, in a decent, you know, I think three and a half hour time, you know, no, having no idea what I was doing and Big Sur was a fairly hard marathon and, and I get to the finish line and I'm looking around, there's all these people hugging and crying and they're like, I mean, this amazing thing. And it's, it's, uh. I make the joke if anybody watches Dexter, it's like Dexter trying to figure out, you know, when he's watching other people have emotions uh-huh. and, and, you know, he's trying to figure out wh- not only why on, he yeah. doesn't feel that way, but how to fake it. Right. And, you know, like I desperately wanted to find somebody to hug and cry so that I could feel fantastic about mm-hmm. what I'd just done. And instead I just went out and got drunk that night. Right. And uh, you bring up an important point, which is this idea. And I relate to that. I used to do this all the time. Um, this false pride that takes over. Like you test yourself, say, well, if I can go out and do, run this marathon, I can just bang out these marathons on the weekend, then I must not have a drinking problem. It's artillery to, uh, you know, sort of, you know, use it uh, as you will to uh, continue to be able to justify your drinking and using, right? And yeah. and also like, hey, look what I did. Like not only did I, you know, run, I, I went out, I got completely shit-faced. I woke up, I was hungover, and I still ran a marathon. Like what did you do this weekend? You know what I mean? And, and it's like there's no humility in that. There's a complete false pride thing that takes over that leads you in a very dark direction ultimately. I was, at the end of those first few marathons, I could not have been emptier and, and it actually even goes back to what we were talking about before, because I had the raw emotion, like I'd done this work and I mm-hmm. had indeed scraped off those outer layers to find that I was absolutely completely empty inside. Mm. And at least drugs and alcohol, uh, you know, gave some texture to the emptiness and then being, you know, having that not as a crutch, uh, really, uh, we really was something I couldn't imagine at the time. And mm-hmm. I was doing, you know, I was at 25 or six, you know, I wanted to, like, I think I bought my first house right around there and I bought cars and I wanted to be and was like the top salesman at whatever job I was doing. Mm-hmm. And those were all nothing more than my proof that clearly there can't be any kind of a problem. Mm-hmm. If, if I can do those things, then, you know, how could I possibly have a problem? Right. And that looming sense of ep- emptiness is so terrifying that the only way to deal with it is to drink more and use more. Fill it. I could fill it up that way, at least, you know, temporarily. Right. And, and that's of course what we all do in that situation. And, you know, and it taught me, it, it did teach me, I will say, it, it did teach me how to suffer properly. Mm-hmm. You know, the things I did to mm-hmm. myself then, that's true suffering. And when I'm, when I'm out running and whether I'm falling apart or having a great run, I mean, even races like Badwater, people tend to think that, oh, you know, you, you did it and you had a good time and like a good finishing time and you placed well and whatever. So you had a fantastic race. Like somehow that means that you didn't struggle during the race. Mm -hmm. And like Badwater is a race that, you know, I've never not thrown up at Badwater. Like it's the only race I've ever thrown up in, in Mm -hmm. fact, but I've done it every single time. Like something about the, the heat mechanism there Mm -hmm. and just the, the point being that there's a series of ups and downs during that race that are inevitable. And no matter how I plan, they're going to happen, mm-hmm. those, those, those downs. And that's what I finally had to understand. Well, it's what I've had to understand about sobriety. It's over 21 years. That didn't mm-hmm. stop me from going to prison a couple of years ago. Right. You know, it didn't, <clears throat> it didn't stop, you know, my first marriage from falling apart. It didn't stop, it didn't stop anything. Life mm-hmm. just continued to roll on. It's mm-hmm. just that I actually had to be present for it, which mm-hmm. was, which was really. You had to feel it. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's sort of that idea that, uh, you know, sobriety doesn't promise you anything other than, uh, you know, a life without drinking or using, you know, and there's this, this notion, I think when you come in and you have the pink cloud that all your problems will be solved. And and in fact, you have to sort of deal with the wreckage and all these problems, but you actually have to feel them and you're like a loose, you know, a, a raw nerve ending at first. And, and, but, but the beauty of it is to be able to walk through those challenges and those difficulties with dignity. And, uh, and, and that's something that I think you did in spades, you know, in terms of your, you know, your prison sentence, your jail sentence. I mean, you know, I've been following you on Twitter for a long time and I remember, um, you know, you would send out these tweets and I'm thinking, 
is he allowed to tweet from jail or is his son doing it for him? Like, how is this even, I'm like fascinated by the, like the, just the pure logistics of how that happened, but persistently putting out, uh, you know, this positive message, this refusal to allow this experience to control you or to lapse into some kind of victimhood. Um, and then to read, subsequently or during the latter stages of, of your tenure there, the impact that you're having on your fellow inmates and these guys that are starting to run and are losing tremendous amounts of weight and are kind of rediscovering their lives in a new way. Yeah, it, it was that part of the experience was fascinating. And it, and it is the, you know, one of the basic tenets of, of addiction recovery, which is attraction rather than promotion. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't go into prison and say, Hey, all you, all you fat guys over there, you guys should come run with me. You know, it's been a great way to get my ass kicked. Right. (laughs) And so instead I simply just did what I do. I just went and I, I, I ran and I worked out and I, I actually found people, there was no AA in prison. If you can believe it, it was shocking. Amazing. In federal prison, I can't believe that. I mean, I've done tons of panels in, yeah. in jails and stuff. In, so. in state and in jails and those places, absolutely. They they have pretty active programs. But the federal? F- nope. No formal Why? AA. Is there a reason for that? Or I, Well, I ended up teaching, which is funny, addiction recovery uh, classes. Uh-huh. And they were well attended, but guys got certificates. You know, you were sort of required to do a certain amount of, of that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, while you're there, which is good. It's good and healthy, but most of the guys sitting in there were there to get the certificate. And Mm -hmm. and like any AA meeting, though, I would absolutely, you know, I just did what I would do and hope that somebody maybe got something out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's it's an interesting thing. So I was in Beckley uh, Federal Prison, and there is, it is actually, ironically, a drug education prison, Meaning that they have a program where guys who, I mean, 90% of the people there are there for drugs anyway, Mm -hmm. most for for selling, not for using, but, uh, you know, they were required if they wanted, they had a chance to get time off of their sentence if they completed this very long nine month, uh, you know, drug education program. Right. But basically the, and I'm sure the, I'm sure the the prison and the the program would argue with this viewpoint. But my viewpoint was that the program basically said, you're bad. You have destroyed your family. You've destroyed your lives. Don't do drugs. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was the extent of the education, you know? So it wasn't really recovery oriented. It was more of a sort of a nine month shaming process. You're a piece of shit. (laughs) Don't do drugs, you know? And, and so Uh, stop doing that. And, and while a lot of people would probably think that's like, a good approach it's somehow. the Nancy Reagan, yeah. just say no approach. The fact is that can be, that's all well and good. People can be, you know, feel strongly about how they view people who, who do drugs or have gotten in trouble with the law for mm-hmm. doing drugs. But the reality is if the goal is to actually turn out people when they come out of prison who are better than when they went in and more likely to make a contribution to society, then shaming them is certainly not the way, mm-hmm. you know, to do it. And very little is spent on, on treatment, as we all know. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's been proven time and again that every dollar that's spent on prevention uh, will come back tenfold, mm-hmm. whereas, you know, every, every dollar that's spent on incarceration and on sending these guys... That's why, you know, it's another reason, Rich, that I never... I really, it would be embarrassing to me to complain about my plight and how I might have felt about how, you know, how that all happened to me. Mm -hmm. When I'm in there with guys, African American guys who got 20 year sentences for a small handful of crack that I had in my hand tons of times. Mm -hmm. And if I had been a black man in this country in those times, I would have been stopped driving the car that I would have, that I was driving, right. which was just a Toyota 4Runner. It's not like mm. it was fancy, but I would have been stopped. They would have searched me. They would have found that, and I would have been the guy getting 20 years. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't that guy. I was the white guy driving the car in the hood that, for whatever reason, just never, you know, that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I knew that it, it would have been embarrassing to me uh, being in there next to guys who really had their lives, their whole lives taken away from them. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, and, the, and actually, the, you know, the sentencing and the Congress and everyone else is now acknowledging that the 100 to 1 crack to cocaine sentencing guidelines were very possibly the most, um, you know, unfavorable and really unforgivable sentencing guideline ever handed down in any mm-hmm. country. And so there are, there are some changes being made to those guidelines now and acknowledgement that that was wrong. But anyway, my, yeah, my point mean, of all that is I, I, would, I would have felt like a, a total idiot. Yeah, but you're also a human being who's been incarcerated and could yeah. very easily hang your hat on this you know, argument as to how you'd been wronged. And you know, in recovery, they say you know, justifiable anger is you know, a luxury we, can, we cannot afford. Um, but that's, you know, a, a stupid little, you know, yeah. annoying saying and, and to be able to, you know, to be able to actually embody that in, when you're in the scenario that you're in, I mean, is no small feat. Well, I knew very quickly. Mm-hmm. And even even after I got arrested, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there and in, in, in this holding cell knowing that my life had just changed forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was the night after the day after the uh Running America premiere. Right, you had the premiere, and then yeah. it was the next the day. Next so, day. just we should probably complete the timeline a little bit, so that people that don't don't really know your story mm-hmm. um, can understand what we're talking about. And that was May. I mean, well, we had. Uh, I mean, essentially, you're at the end of your drinking and using. You're essentially living out of your car and smoking crack, essentially. Oh, yeah. And there's some kind of altercation that involves bullets in your forerunner. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. That, and your son being born that catalyzes, uh, y- you know, you embracing sobriety. Yeah, well, is I was accurate. Or, it is in yeah. Wichita, Kansas, which is, I always say, if you can get, if, if you can get sober in Wichita, you can get sober anywhere. <laughs> no, there was, there was good sobriety there, but it was, it was a place where I don't know why it was different. I just sat there on the curb that day looking at the police going through my car and I'd been up for six days without sleeping or eating. And it was another in a long line of those episodes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just remember looking and and thinking to myself, okay, this just seems like a pretty good time to quit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a religious person. You know, I'm certainly uh, spiritual, which is sort of the, one of those catchphrases these days. And we, we don't have enough time to go into all of that because it's we could talk all day about mm-hmm. that. But, you know, I, I don't know who I was praying to, but I absolutely said, you know, I would like to have this obsession removed because I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I really wasn't, you know, I didn't some days I wanted to, but not not that day. And somehow that weight was lifted from me and you know I started into recovery that day for the first time ever seriously Mm -hmm. I had certainly dabbled in it from time to time and you know I went to a meeting that day and I went to a couple of meetings every single day without missing a day for a year and my life changed very slowly it changed and I became present Mm -hmm. and and uh I struggle. I struggle today, staying present. But mm-hmm. you know, at that point, everything changed. Right, balance being the fickle. I always say balance is the uh, fickle lover that is disinterested in my well, affection. <laughs> well, I got I got sober yeah. and and ran thirty marathons in the right. first few years. So clearly, I had found balance. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so you, but you go off. You go off, and you kind of you know, for lack of a better phrase, make history doing these incredible uh, endurance challenges, you know, the most notable of which is running across the Sahara with um, with Ray and what was the other Kevin. guy's name? Kevin. Yeah, right? Kevin Lynn. Documented in this incredible documentary, which you, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check out, called Running the Sahara, that's narrated by Matt Damon. It's captivating and, and, and brilliant and amazing. Um, and... In many ways, you know, you're sort of on top of the world. You know, you've you've got an agent at the William Morris Agency, mm-hmm. and you're flying around giving motivational speeches and planning your next crazy endurance adventure. Uh, when a uh, a young man by the name of Robert Nordlander gets it into his in, into his skull that uh, there's something there's something a little amiss with this Charlie Engel character. <laughs> well, apparently being an ultra yeah, like, being an ultra runner is a suspect in its own right. Right, you know, you're suspect if you're a runner and and you're spending a lot of time training. You know, somebody might want to know how it is you're managing to make a living if if you're spending all that time running. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is just how it, you know, it's how it came about. And it was a, 
He's like, he was like a local IRS yeah. guy, right? So Correct. he's in your town, you're in the local papers and you're getting a little attention and yeah. And yeah. he's, you know, for some reason, you know, it's, he's got it in him that he's going to. Yeah. He, he decides to start digging and every time he hits a wall, you know, and, and again, it's, it's difficult to go into all, of course, even, a, even touch on the real details, although there'll be, uh, many of them will be in a book soon, but mm you know, the fact of the matter is the Patriot Act is, um, is something that I learned a lot about during that time, because in essence, every time he hit a wall, he was able to basically take some action to, to change the investigation in a way that allowed him to, yeah, to just, once he hit a wall, for example, this supposedly started off as a tax investigation. Mm -hmm. You know, he was curious about, you know, how I, how I paid my bills and my taxes. And when he checked into it, you know what he found? I paid my taxes. Mm -hmm. there, there was no, and I always say to people who are self-employed, especially, I'm like, you let the IRS look through 20 years of your tax returns. If you're self-employed and find nothing, mm -hmm. I, I, I challenge you, you know, to that same thing, but that's exactly what he found mm -hmm. was, it was absolutely nothing. And for some inexplicable, and you know, the I have the memos that show that, and those all came out at trial, and mm -hmm. you know, so there's no secrets there, and because I pay my taxes, but you know, for some reason it didn't end there, and that's that's where I'll probably never understand it. Why? Right. Suddenly he decides he's going to be a DA, right? Like he's mm -hmm. becoming a prosecutor. Who's? I mean, you know, as in his role at the IRS, you would think, well inquiry done, you know, yeah. I explored it. There's nothing there moving on, but that's his job. Of, and, right. and even if, <clears throat> even if you don't like, I mean, he's famously quoted, uh, in the grand jury investigation, he's famously quoted as saying, you know, if I'm riding down the street and I see somebody driving a nice car and I don't think they belong in it, you know, I'll run their tags and pull <laughs> and pull their tax returns. All right, and like, good, apparently, yeah. I mean, that's a direct quote uh, from the grand jury. I mean, there's no, there's right. no doubt about what he said. And I was like, really? That's, that's where we live now that, mm. that, uh, that you can just do that. I mean, but anyway, that's the way it went down. And right. And with the latitude allowed him under the law because of the, the Patriot, Patriot Act. Act. Absolutely. Like you read about these crazy sort of spy novel episodes in your life where they set you up. There was a woman who was planted. You would go on a date with her. You think it's a date, but she's wearing a wire and yeah. all kinds of craziness. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and basically I acknowledged at that time you know, the fact that uh, in hindsight, I had gotten a couple of, of loans, you know, mortgages that were, you know, just like everyone else was getting. I didn't mm -hmm. know I was getting them, just like most people didn't know they were getting mm -hmm. uh, those stated income, stated loans. income loans, right? Yeah. I mean, they, that was just what was being given. I mean, as a, as a borrower, we don't go into a bank, or I certainly wasn't sophisticated enough to go to a bank and say, I want this type of loan. Mm -hmm. You just, you just go in and you fill out whatever paperwork they tell you to fill out and you either qualify or you don't. And I did, you know, I did that exactly the same as I had done a dozen times before, no different in any way, shape or form mm -hmm. during that, you know, 2005 to 2008 or whatever time period, you know, it's widely acknowledged now that it was much easier to get a loan. Mm -hmm. You know, look at, I oh, forgot, yeah, I forgot for who sure. it was in the New York Times today. I think there was, uh, is it J.P. Morgan paying another $20 billion in fines? I mean, they've paid right. something like $100 billion in fines around that whole thing. And it, to say that a borrower, not a, I wasn't in the real estate industry, I, wasn't, I was just a guy, just, mm -hmm. a, just a guy with a little bit of local notoriety to think that I could somehow, you know, manipulate the system in some way, uh, that <laughs> I was some genius mastermind, mm -hmm. which anyone who knows me well <laughs> can attest that's not the case. Uh, you know, it's just absurd. It's, it's actually just, it's laughable. But what happens is, you know, when you're, once you're in the system, you know, he investigated me for over 700 hours uh, just my taxes, mm -hmm. just my taxes. And, and, you know, it's my opinion, you don't do that and come up empty. Mm -hmm. You know, you find a way to reach, right. you know, to reach an end result that is desirable for, for them. And I think it was a little, you know, 
again, years later now, everyone sort of understands that we're, you know, the banks are still answering questions about what happened, but none of them are going to prison. Right. They, essentially they, they pay what, a fine. Right. Essentially what happens is you become this poster boy for mortgage fraud, right. for better or worse. And, and technically there are some improprieties there that allow them to say, you know, yeah, you violated the law here. Um, and let's, let's not look at, you know, s- sentencing guidelines. Let's make this guy an example because, Meanwhile, you have to look at it in the context of what was going on contemporaneously in America. We're in this mortgage crisis all of a sudden. We need to point fingers at people. And rather than taking the guy at J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Bank of America or countrywide, you know, or whatever, let's look at let's let's make Charlie, you know, let's make Charlie the bad guy. Ironically, like the countrywide. Uh, Headquarters are like just down the street. Oh, if you want right. to go visit after, <laughs> after the podcast, there's probably some kind we of go alarm knock on the door. Go yeah, Great. I know you go. I'd like that guy to be uh, doing. He should have done my time. There's a lot of people. A lot of there's time. a lot of people that w- that would say that, and I think we're all still waiting for those guys to be held accountable for a lot of the things that were going on. Yeah, but well, whatever, it'll never happen. Right. So, so here you are. Suddenly, you're going to be you're going to be the guy, and. And kind of in retrospect now, the revisionist history of the whole thing is it, it backfired in the other direction because with all of the kind of you know journalism that transpired <clears throat> around your tenure, you know, it, you ended up coming out looking, you know, like the victim in the whole thing. Well, and I, and I was, and yeah. I mean, I, I you won't hear me say that very often, and mm-hmm. I don't want to dwell on that. But I, I what I also knew, and sobriety is what taught me this. Recovery is what taught me this. I had a choice. Like when that happened mm-hmm. and when I, uh, a good friend of mine actually said to me something that I was one of the greatest compliments I've ever been given in my life. Like, cause the people around me were devastated, you know, of course my family, right. but my, my friends, I mean, people by the hundreds were, you know, were just didn't know what to say. I mean, they looked at me like I, I had a terminal disease and, and it was like, what do you say to a guy who's getting ready to go off to prison? And, right. and it was me that was consoling them most of the time. And so my, my great friend, uh, Chris Justice, who helped me with many things, uh, you know, he basically said, you know, you're, sp- <laughs> you're spending all your time making us feel better instead of the other way around. Mm. And, and what I figured out quickly, though, and it was, again, because of, because of my long-term recovery, I believe, I believe this, and that is that I had a choice. I could either be miserable or I could be as positive as was possible. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't pink cloud positive. It wasn't like some false positive. Like I, I had to say, okay, I'm going to find a way to make the best of this. And I, I have mm. no idea what that even means yet. But, you know, ultimately, I went in there just just saying that uh, I can be one of those guys. And I saw them every day who had long prison sentences and they they checked off the calendar every day. Mm -hmm. And to me, that would have been maddening. I don't know if I would have made it through my short time. You know, it was a year and a half, which is a long time. But relatively speaking, not that long compared to many of them. Right, 16 months. But it was the sentence longer? The sentence was 21, 21. months. Okay. And the way the federal system works is you sort of get a, you get a pre-nearly 15% discount <laughs> right. on your sentence. It's, you get your good behavior in advance. And if you screw it's it up, they can take it, it away. I right? got you. And then technically you, you, you normally so would get... So generous of them. Yeah, absolutely. You normally would get 10% of the halfway house... And so that's what I got to. That's why it was a it was a 21 month sentence. Basically, I had to serve 18 months of it. But after 16 months, I was released to a halfway house in gotcha. Greensboro, which actually, by the way, was far worse than prison. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, in a in a camp like where I was, and basically there with nonviolent criminals, generally speaking. Mm. I mean, a lot of them. Well, are Beckley was fact, divided. There's a there was a like a minimum a security and, yeah. a min- and a medium and a medium right, right. and the medium. And, you know, I got to know some of those guys, too, because they would graduate from there. I don't mean graduate right. like high school, but, you know, they would move from there if they if they were less than 10 years left on their sentence and, and whatever. They might come to the to the lower mm-hmm. security place. And, you know, what I what I what I found was, of course, that, you know, these were almost all just regular guys. But when mm-hmm. I got to the halfway house, you have guys from all security levels that are mm-hmm. being dumped into the halfway house. 
you know, so you got some right. some rapists and murderers and some, you know, some some genuine bad guys in there, and you're, you know, thirty people stuck in one room on bunk beds, and you can't leave. It was uh, how it was, it was tough. How different is it from? I mean, my only sort of point of context, other than doing the occasional panel, um, you know, in downtown LA is what I see on television or what I see in movies. You know, my, this is what, this is the way a prison guard acts and behaves. It's all informed by media that I've seen. It's all, you know, crafted by a screenwriter and a director. So how, how, uh, you know, how different is the real life experience of being in a place like that versus, you know, what did you expect and how is it different? Well, of course I feared the worst, you know, all Mm. the time. I went in there on Valentine's Day, 2011. That was the first day of my sentence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my my major concern was being someone's Valentine that night. Yeah. And, or any night. And, uh, or any morning. Or any morning or any time. And that, (laughs) you know, that didn't happen. Um, at least I'm debating as, asking as you as, the question of right. whether you did become somebody's Valentine. <laughs> we'll never tell. <laughs> yeah. We've been sworn to that, secrecy. We, maybe, to, maybe that'll be in the book. You'll have to read the book yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but it was, you know, it was very similar in in many ways to what we do see on television. That the difference is, I of course, being on that side of it, got to see the human aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I got to know guys and. I got to know their families and visitation. I got to see their pictures and hear their stories and hear about their lives. And, you know, it's a funny thing about running and working out. You know, all of us who do that understand the camaraderie that's built. Mm -hmm. And so every day out in the rec yard when we're doing whatever workout we might be doing or running around that quarter mile loop and talking and, and just, you know, commiserating, it was fascinating to find you know the similarities were far greater than the differences Mm -hmm. and you know and it is true most of them you know the large majority of people in there came from poor backgrounds and they were they were destined for prison i i watched this um i watched this amazing documentary just this past week called the house i live in Mm -hmm. it's on netflix by the way uh, they didn't pay me to say that, mm-hmm. but it's a, it was so fascinating because it really explained so much around the history of incarceration in this country and where, you know, where it came from and and why we have fourteen thousand statutes on the books mm-hmm. that are actually punishable by prison sentences. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 amazing the things that are illegal and and yet. You know, 97% of the people who are in prison are there for nonviolent crimes. So what we do is we we lock up the people that we're mad at, not the people that we're afraid of. And what is the percentage of <clears throat> of incarcerated people that's related to substance abuse? Almost all. It's got to be, yeah. Almost all, over right. 90% <clears throat> are related to drugs. And, and less than 1% of those... Uh, have anything to do with the word, you know, kingpin. <laughs> right. Almost all of them are just regular drug users. Mm-hmm. And, and yet the lack of, of treatment and, uh, and rehabilitation within the system, it's almost non-existent. It's shocking. I mean, we, we in this country, we have 5% of the population of the world in the United States, yet we have 25% of the incarceration in mm-hmm. the world. So, you know, in the, in the free, I don't know what the answer is, but I I know that we haven't found it. And the tough on, tough on crime is the words, but it's really tough on drugs Mm -hmm. is, is the way it plays out. You know, it just really means that, you know, alcohol and, and other drugs have just have better lobbyists, you know, I mean, well, and the more privatized, uh, incarceration becomes then, you know, then <laughs> the K street lobbyists start yeah. lining their pockets and this is not going in any other direction other than to continue to expand. Well, if you build it, they will fill it, mm-hmm. you know, is how it goes. And, and here's the thing. I'm certainly a liberal at heart. There's no doubt. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a liberal guy, but uh, from a fiscal standpoint, no matter which side of the political aisle you're on, if you take a look at the economics of locking people up for incredibly long, sen- you, you lock up a 20-year-old for 20 years, 
on a drug sentence, mm -hmm. that person will end up being a ward of the state or a ward of the taxpayers for the rest of their lives. Right. And what is it like sixty thousand dollars a year or something like that it's per crazy. person? And that's on maybe the and that's only the hard cost maybe of what it you know, feeding them housing. That doesn't count that doesn't actually take into account the the cost of maintaining the entire system. Mm -hmm. I mean it's it's a it's a crazy, crazy big number. Right. And when we were although I don't know when this was, when we were flush with cash or felt like we were in this country, then that was fine. Everybody gets behind tough on crime. You don't want to be the politician that stands up and says, you know, we should ease up on these guys mm -hmm. some. But what, what it's done is create this situation where now we have to pay for it. And, and it's not just paying for it while they're in prison. It's paying when they get out. And, you know, I don't know, as your neighbor, would you rather have the guy who who's actually had some strong rehabilitation and learned a skill and, and had some positive things happen mm -hmm. as your neighbor, because they're going to get out and they're going to move somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, or would you rather have the angry guy who just lost, you know, 20 years of his life and feels like he was wronged and he's just wait, basically he's just waiting to go back. Right. I mean, he can't, well, and he can't get a job and he's dependent no. upon the state to, you know, provide. Yeah. Recidivism to, rates yeah. are 70%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why most guys go back. They can't, they, right. they just can't quite get over the hump. And, and it's not even to say, I mean, there's programs to help guys. There's all those things, but it's, it's easier said than done. You know, I mean, for me, I get to check that box right. <laughs> for the rest of my life. The, uh, the, the article that I enjoyed the most on, you know, all the sort of articles that are out there from, you know, outside men's fitness, New York times, all that kind of stuff that, that kind of talks about your, your prison experience was the one in um, the Oxford American. Cause that really got at the heart of like, this is what it's really like. I'll put a, I'll put a link in the show notes up to that, but it was a very touching piece. Um, Leslie Jameson wrote that and she was incredible. You know, she came to, to visit me. And what's funny is it goes back to, to running, right? Right. Because <clears throat> you had met her at an ultra, right? I she met her at the Barkley. Right. I met her at the Barkley. And her, she wasn't mm -hmm. running, but her brother uh, was actually running the race. And she wrote a, a piece about him for the race. I wrote mm -hmm. a piece about the race for Runner's World, mm -hmm. actually, um, that got put off being published. It actually was published in Runner's World while I was at Beckley, mm -hmm. which, was, which was pretty <laughs> fascinating. Do the do publications like Runner's World are they scared of you now or are no. you there they they just love the story yeah no yeah, they love the like, story and yeah. I, I give I give David Willie and the guys at Runner's World great you know great mm -hmm. credit for recognizing that you know readers are sophisticated enough to make their own decisions and it's and if I can tell a decent story <laughs> right. I mean that's what it should be about right if yeah. I can if I can tell a decent story I mean I used to make the joke that I'm I'm uh, even with running the Sahara, you know, a lot of people might admire me for that. Some people really dislike me for it. I mean, it's all over the board. But my attitude is if something happens where people actually have a strong opinion and want to talk about it, I'm happy. Yeah, it's good, right? I still get mm -hmm. I got a note last week from a guy like on Facebook who said, you know, uh, you know, you were, you were the biggest jerk in that movie and this and that. <laughs> and I wrote, he gave some reasons and I wrote him back. I said, I said, dude, I couldn't agree with you more. I said, you know, yeah. but just, just realize that it's not always exactly, you know, exactly what you see. And that's the right. way everything is. That's the way, right. that's the way prison was. That's, you know, again, I'm, I'm hoping that in writing, I can tell that story, uh, in a, in a way that doesn't, you know, I don't want to bore anybody and we're not going to go into all the details in the book of, of, you know, every minuscule thing that happened at trial or in mm -hmm. prison, but the book is really going to be a running book more than anything. But, but I mean, there is room to kind of talk about all of that. Right. So the, the working title is running on empty, running in place, running in place. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I had the great privilege of reading the proposal and, and, some of the, the sample materials, the sample chapters that you've already prepared. And it's, it's a barn burner. And I, when I first reached out to you, I think I even said on Twitter, I was like, I can't wait to read this guy's book. Like, this is the book, you know, like if you like finding ultra, this is like finding ultra on steroids times a billion, you know, like the <laughs> epic tale of Gilgamesh or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm interested in where you're at right now in the process and you know, what, you know, how, how long is it going to be? And do you know, kind of the trajectory of, how are you yeah. going to get this book done and out? 
I've got a, a fantastic agent, and uh, we, with the help of a professional uh, team, really, we managed to put out a, I think, what is a really good proposal, and that mm-hmm. proposal is actually out to publishers. Just oh, it's a, oh, you went out with it already? Just now. Out. Literally, oh, cool. literally oh, just exciting. now. And we've, we've had a couple of great responses already, fantastic. And, and I'm hoping that uh, in the very near future there'll be a, an announcement to be made that, that you know, then it's like it's kind of like it's kind of like entering a race though. Then I actually have to write it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, as you know, I know, is uh, just one day at a time. Yeah, yeah. I wrote about yeah. I think I wrote about a thousand pages when I was at Beckley, and uh-huh. so um, if I could just you know transfer all that over and it was useful, that'd be great. But it, again, as you know, that's not the way the yeah, but at least works. you don't. But but it's not a, you're not staring at a blank page. You have all this material to work with. You know, I've done enough. It's not things. like you don't know the story either. Yeah, it's mine. I can't I can't <laughs> I really be wrong, yeah. can I? <laughs> uh-huh. You know, the question is, can I make it compelling? And I and I like to think that uh, that it'll be. You know, I I'm, I'm here to say as always that that it's a work in progress, and I, so am I. And and there will I will never have all the answers to you know who I am and why I do things and I don't think any of us do and and if I if I quit asking those questions then I'm I'm in trouble I, I I'll tell you something actually uh Astasiana uh who I'm lucky enough to be marrying on Saturday you know asked me one of the hardest questions I've ever been asked <laughs> At, at one of our first dates and she she sort of looked at me probably wisely wondering you know what was going on mm-hmm. with with me and because there's all these uh tales of misery you know i'm good at overcoming the difficult things and you know putting myself sometimes you know some of the things i did myself some were done to me uh which is like most of us mm-hmm. and some some things just happen and uh, i'm good at setting my mind to that but you know she asked me the question you know do i do i have any clue how to be happy mm-hmm. like how to just be happy like if things were going fantastically could i just be happy mm-hmm. and i thought it was the most amazing question ever because i realized right away that really the answer to that question was no mm-hmm. you know they don't re- i've never really understood like like how to be happy and and I'm hoping that there's, you know, that there is, that ability is going to grow in me. Certainly with, with, with her, uh, it will be forced to grow because mm-hmm. she's, she's much better at it than I am. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, it's an interesting thing. You know, I've all, I think maybe I've relied on suffering and my desire somehow to suffer and find my discovery through suffering uh, that that's the way I've always functioned. And so, well, you have, you have alcoholism. It's the yeah. ism, it's the, I seek misery. Yeah. Right. But you know, happiness, happiness, I don't think is a, uh, a destination. It's a, it's a process. And I think it, you know, I think that, um, <clears throat> you get glimpses of it or I get glimpses of it when you can get out of yourself and be of service. And when you're, tapped into somebody that you care about and when you are expressing yourself authentically, you know, and I think that in terms of your book, if all you do is share your experience and you do it honestly with integrity and you allow yourself to be vulnerable in that process, that it will be difficult and you will suffer just like you do in an ultra but there will be a sense of satisfaction. And I think we talk a lot about happiness, but it's really about like, are you going to be a satisfied human? I think that's more of, that's a, a better sort of inquiry or one at least I can relate to a little bit more. I agree. And, and the, the, the fear, although it's not rational, but it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. rational. You know, the fear is somehow that if I'm a content, like even for five minutes, that yeah. I'm going to lose some edge. Right. Like that, that, <laughs> oh my God, now I'm going to sit on the sofa and, and eat popcorn for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And, and that would just be terrible. And, and it's finding, it is, it's fi- trying to find some sort of a balance where I can enjoy myself. I can mm-hmm. enjoy just being uh, and not always be looking forward to whatever that next thing is. And, and I, you know, I vowed, now you know that when when run to boston is finished this year you know i'm gonna 
it's not even so-called taking a break. It's just going to do nothing. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's, it's time to be married and to work on life actually, mm-hmm. instead of always working on, doesn't mean I won't be looking forward towards something, you know, at some right. point in the future, but it's, it's finding that next thing that she and I can do together and that, uh, you know, we can, we can travel to some great place. I mean, we took our first, we got engaged in Puerto Rico and it was the first time I had traveled, <laughs> traveled. I was going to say out of the country, right. Puerto Rico is a Not great, a gray area. Related. Exactly. Yeah. In more than 10 years yeah. that I had actually gone somewhere. If you don't count prison. Yeah. I was going to say, well, Beckley, but yeah, you, well, Beckley, you ran right? Badwater at Beckley. I so did. technically you went there to do that, right? <laughs> exactly. <So. laughs> But we had an actual vacation. Yeah. And now she's a former pro athlete, so we ran every day. And we, you know, we, we certainly were very active, but I wasn't there for an event. Uh-huh. Uh, although the event turned out to be and uh, you didn't, getting engaged. You didn't, so. uh, you know, dissolve. <clears throat> no, yeah. I, apparently I got through it just fine. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, been a, it's been a strange and interesting learning curve these last few years. And... The, the, the oddest thing about it is, you know, if I knew I could be here right now, uh, you know, getting married on Saturday and, and just all the things going on for me, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even change the last few years right. and, uh, and the difficulties. And you touched on it a second ago, being at Beckley, I, I had some of the most satisfying times of my entire life while I was in there mm-hmm. because there's, there's nothing like you know, watching somebody else transform and, and knowing that I at least had a small hand in helping them change their own life, whether it was losing weight or, or, you know, or just running or, you know, working out or changing their, their attitude towards how they ate. I mean, even in, even in prison, you know, you got this, this issue with eating all the time. I don't know. It was just really, it was wonderful. Well, I think what's great about that is, um, you know, by the way, I don't, I don't want to do it again, by the way, no, just, yeah. just to be clear. Let's try to, yeah, let's try to okay. avoid that. Right. right. Um, what I loved about it though, was that it really was this kind of, um, you know, we using the principles of recovery in that, you know, you referenced it earlier, right? You know, it's a, it's a program of attraction, um, not, uh, not, uh, promotion, promotion or recruitment. And so you would just go out and run every day and you weren't like trying to get anyone else to go with you. You're like, this is what I'm doing. And then slowly, you know, these guys are starting to show up and I love the characters. They're like Butterbean and Bootsy and, and block and these guys, Yeah. you know, the, the, from what I can understand, like the furthest thing from, you know, being an athlete or being a runner, some of them tremendously overweight. And over the course of this, 16 month period, like one guy lost 180 pounds or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Adam, you know? Adam. I mean, it's, it's so schmaltzy that it's like, Oh, th- what is this? A Disney movie? Like this is the, you know, the guy, yeah. you, can, you know, you could see the montage sequence in the, in the movie about how that all transpires, but there's, you know, there's real beauty in that. Well, there's some good guys too. I mean, that again, through whatever circumstance, you know, I mean, some of them are just addicts. Some mm-hmm. of them, you know, had other, other issues or just bad luck or whatever. And there were a few genuine bad guys, of course. I mean, you know, prison isn't full of people that, that shouldn't be there. Right. <laughs> There's a few that should, but generally speaking, you know, they were just regular guys. And I, what I found funny is nobody ever, of course, came up to me. Uh, initially guys even made fun of me to a certain degree, which is not unusual for me, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, you know, through time and the fact that they saw me continuing to run and to do these things, you know, they would never like approach me in the middle of, uh, you know, the chow line or something like that. They would come up to me sort of surreptitiously and say, Hey, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, man, I'm thinking about, I've been thinking about running, Uh you know, what, what do you, what do you think I should do? Like very quietly. Mm -hmm. I even had a couple of the guards in there who, who came to me for running advice. And that was totally against, Mm -hmm. You know, any, oh, any they're not really any allowed policy. to see uh-huh. no, no. And they were, you know, again, and those guys were, you know, some of them weren't good guys. I mean, unfortunately you take guys and give them some power in a situation like that. And, and, and there were a lot that really treated people poorly, but there were also plenty who were, you know, were in fact just doing their job, mm-hmm. you know, and I never held that against them and, uh, were good guys. And if they asked me, you know, how to start a running program. I'd, I'd tell, a, a an officer just as much as I'd tell a, 
you know, an inmate because running is running, man. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're willing to, if you're willing to take a shot at it, then I don't want to ever discourage anybody from getting out there and, and finding out what they can do. Mm -hmm. And are you still, are you in touch with these guys still? You, you know, that's the, that's the irony. No, is the, is the, the answer. And the reason is not because I don't want to be, but it's not allowed uh, oh, a former inmate yeah, can't yeah. correspond with somebody who's inside. Correct. I didn't know that. Yeah, and actually, technically, I can't. I mean, it's been interesting for me just because I'm I'm easy to find, uh, uh, you know, out here in the world. And so, if somebody that I was in there with wants to find me, mm -hmm. you know, through whatever social media or anything else, it's 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 right. pretty much impossible to stop. Uh, although I do laugh every once in a while, I'll get some kind of note from somebody and I, I tell you the truth, it'll be their real name and I have no uh -huh. idea who it is because oh, they've got sure. a name. It's not, got a it's name not like Butterball. Butterbean. <laughs> yeah, Butterbean, right. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. It's not allowed. So it's, it's been, it, it, it's weird and frustrating. It'd be like going to college, you know, for, for years with guys or being in a fraternity or being mm -hmm. on some team sometime. And then when that's over, never being allowed to have contact with mm -hmm. them again. And it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I assume Can you go visit or no? No, can't, God, they no, won't let no, you visit no, or anything. No, I can't visit. I can't vote. I what, can't. Is the, uh, the rationale is that you're, you could be some sort of proxy for them to it, it take is, care of business in the outside world on yeah. their behalf or something? Well, it, not only that, it's just that technically, you know, if you, if you have supposedly bad guys that are all, you know, continuing to have contact with each other, right. then that could somehow oh, lead oh, to something. No. I mean, the, <laughs> here, the irony yeah. I've always found in that is that, you know, prison is essentially, you know, criminal college. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to say what I could do because I'd probably get myself in trouble. But, you know, the the stories you hear and the things that you learn, you learn how skills. to do. You and got some then, skills Right. Now. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, my drug past is uh, going to be right where it belongs, and that's in the past forever. But, you know, the, the ways people do things. I mean, and I will say that, you know, meth is the killer of today, mm -hmm. you know, very much like other drugs have been in the past. But it's the, it's the scourge of the earth right now, mm -hmm. and, and you can make it in a bathtub. And so... It's a it's bad news, but I mean I guess the the idea is that they don't want guys you know being able to get together when they get out of prison, and there's you know I there is some logic to that, but once you've shoved them together uh, to to basically share information in a, in, a, mm -hmm. in tight quarters for months or years together, you know that ship has kind of sailed. Right. But mm -hmm. so it's frustrating though. I mean I got you know these guys who who were my friends, are my friends. They'll mm -hmm. always be my friends. I right. mean, at, at, from that time, I, I don't have any idea what's happened to any of them at this point. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of glossed over the fact that you actually ran ran your version of Badwater when you were in prison. It took You had to do it over a couple of days, right? I did. I really let you run uh, a couple hours a day. Yeah, well, they, they discourage, I think the rules probably even say you're not supposed to run more than, you know, three miles at any time or something. And uh, they made an exception for you. Well, they, they, you know, they didn't really make an exception. I just sort of did it. But, um, you know, it is, I still had to go inside for, you know, count. And obviously I had to sleep inside. But they um, let you go out in the yard all day and, camps, and do it? Yeah, a, a camp um, is interesting because, you know, you do have, you have jobs. I mean, my job mm -hmm. was working in recreation. And so I had to, like, clean the pool tables every morning. And there was some, I had specific jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I taught classes, uh, the addiction recovery classes, those kinds of things. But, you know, in a, in a sense at a, at a camp, there is, you know, there's guys in there that have to work. You know, I was mm -hmm. lucky enough that, um, you know, I had some support. It was my own money, but I had some, some I, I had the ability to get some money every month sent in. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a limit to that. It's very complicated, but suffice it to say, some guys in there, there's nobody that they don't have anybody on right. the outside. If they don't earn ten dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever it might be that month, then they can't go buy, you know, a new pair of tennis shoes right. at the commissary, or they can't get, you know, snacks or coffee or anything else. And so 
those guys work. Right. And very often what you'll see, not to be too detailed, but where you see a camp, you'll usually see like a medium mm-hmm. prison, a higher level security. And it's really a lot of the guys at the camp, it's their job to actually take care of mm. the grounds or whatever it mm-hmm. might be for for the higher level security mm-hmm. prison. So it's a very intricate, interesting, weird, twisted system. But, um, you know, for me, I was able to uh, to teach my classes and to do those things in a way that allowed me, you know, a Get lot of, a lot of freedom during the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, I could go, I could go run. So and you're I, just running around a, a yard. That's what, like a quarter mile in yeah. perimeter or whatever. I call it a goat path because mm-hmm. it even had a hill. So I had to decide, did I want to run the, the, the direction that meant that I went up a sharp steeper hill on one way or the other direction had a much you know, yeah, you had that yeah. short steep down, but you had a much longer gradual up. I don't know. It was very, you know, like any runner, I overthought it. <laughs> yeah, I was like you laying day. in bed at night, like <laughs> pondering this deep you know, that decision way. that you have to make. Is that way faster or is the <laughs> yeah. other way faster? But, you know, I got to where I was doing, I mean, I, I did speed work. I did all kinds of stuff in there and even was able to, you know, I ran a few five minute miles in there and did some things I hadn't done for mm-hmm. many, many years. So just because... I had the time to do it, and, uh, you know, I read... Yeah, you're not going to be returning any phone calls no, or anything. Yeah. I read 150 books. I wrote every day. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I did my best under really stressful circumstances to take care of my, my body, but also my mm-hmm. my spirit, and that, that was done by helping other people. And look, you know <laughs> from being in recovery... Mm-hmm. Talk about helping other people sounds very giving and very generous. Yeah. And, you know, we know in addiction recovery that the thing that I can do that is is absolutely the most selfish thing I can do and best for me is to help someone else. Right. And so I set my sights on, on doing that and still, you know, hopefully still do. You know, I get a lot mm-hmm. of requests to, to speak and to, to do things, you know, with, you know, talk to kids and mm-hmm. adults alike. And, and I try to never say no to those mm-hmm. things just because I think it's, it's what I'm required to do. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to keep it, you yeah. got to give it away. Exactly. So how did the Twitter thing work? You got to answer this drive <clears throat> me crazy. Yeah. So I had a, I had a, fr- the, the way prisons work these days is they do federal prisons are equipped with computers these days. Uh-huh. It's very expensive and it's very limited. The amount of time you can spend on it. So what I would do is I would actually write my tweets uh, in advance, and sometimes I would mail them out in a in a letter. Sometimes I uh-huh. would get on email, but that was heavily that was monitored by by the system. But it wasn't illegal. It's not you know again the, there it did turn into a they didn't care for it. Let's just put it that way. They weren't happy about the they, fact that you're tweeting from you know. no. They weren't happy about it, but the fact of the matter is, and someone else had to actually, you know, type the tweet. Exactly, the thing, right? Exactly, but that happens every day, mm-hmm. you know, all, all over the place, and it's not illegal. There's no, and I wasn't, you know, if I had been sending out posts that said, you know, here's how you sneak some contraband yeah. into me, or then, you know, naming the guard by his name, and, or yeah, yeah, anything, or even, <laughs> or even an inmate by his uh, name, then that's not cool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done that, but. You know, it was all generic. I mean, my, my favorite one was I did this whole little series called Overheard. Uh-huh. I, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was some there was some funny stuff, you know, yeah. because because guys in there, you know, would just say, you know, say some crazy things, you know. It was it was uh, I don't even know if I can give an example. I know, I'm trying to remember. Well, I'm standing in line, you know, for lunch one day and you know, these two guys are talking in front of me and one of them looks at the other one and says, Now wait a minute. Exactly what part of the cow does the liver come from? <laughs> yeah. It's like we were having liver and onions uh, that day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and another guy asked me, he asked me, he's like, now, you know, how many laps around this track equals a cupcake? Uh, you right. know, things like that. And I mean, they're, they're just, they're great, funny, mm-hmm. you know, genuine questions. And some, and also some heart-wrenching things, you know, guys uh, who... No doubt who hadn't seen their kids for 10 years and they're getting mm-hmm. a visit that day and, you know, things like that. I mean, it was, uh, it, I it mean, was, speaking of that, how has that, um, kind of colored your relationship with your sons? I mean, how is that? 
man, how's that impacted? Well, my kids are doing great, but I couldn't have, I I couldn't have been taken away from them. I mean, is there ever a good time, Mm -hmm. but they were teenage boys and, you know, one of them, my youngest is now a freshman at UNC in Chapel Hill. And, and he's, you know, to say they survived it and got through it. Okay is just to acknowledge the physical manifestation of what happened. I mean, you know, they're still alive. Yeah, they're, you know, they're doing their thing. They're living their lives. But, you know, it's a it's a pretty uh, scary thing, you know, mm. for a teenage boy to just have, have their dad, you know, taken away. And, and my older son's had some addiction issues himself. And, you know, he's doing fantastically right now. And he's a... He's a personal trainer, and I'm, I'm hoping that both of them get to come out during Run to Boston and spend mm-hmm. some time out on the road and to helping out. And, you know, they're, they're doing well, but it, it, you know, it destroyed my family. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it, and the, the shock waves from that will probably never go away fully. You know, but I say to them the same thing that I'd say to anybody – nobody can ruin my life except for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nobody gets the, the right to do that. Not, you know, not, you know, some federal agent, not prison, not a prison guard, not anybody. You know, I'm fully capable of messing up my own life. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and But to kind of come out of Beckley and, and carry that pain of knowing that, you know, what happened really impacted those boys, yeah. you know, in a, in a profound way. And how do you, you know, kind of move forward with that? Well, and as a father, they, they, you know, I called them and I wrote and I would do all the things that I could. And it was, you know, at the beginning, we had a lot of contact. And as, as time moved forward, you know, what I was, and this is my, my kids are loving boys who both will, you know, hug and kiss me in public, you know, right. and, and I judge that as, as success as a father. But they, they, to protect themselves, actually had to, like, withdraw from me to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was almost like too painful to hear from mm-hmm. me. Right. And, and I tried to respect that and to not try to be, and one of the hardest things to do is to try to stay in touch, but also try to not be like a parent. Like I couldn't, mm-hmm. I couldn't tell them what to do right. from the situation I was in. And, you know, again, and I watched other guys, I learned from other guys. I had a guy, you know, block who was listed on your, your list there, you know, and he had a, a son who was one of the top basketball players in the country. And he's the first one who said to me, man, you got to let it go. Mm-hmm. You got to let it go. Cause I'd call and I wouldn't hear back. I'd go weeks sometimes without hearing from my own kids. And he'd say, you got to let it go. They're in their own pain right now. And you just got to let them get through it. You can't save mm-hmm. them and they can't save you, you know, do your time. Don't let your time do you. Right. Right. And there's this um, incredible dichotomy between, you know, your Beckley, which equals imprisonment, and running, which is ultimate freedom, right? These two worlds butting up against each other and your ability to find freedom through running during your imprisonment. You know, it's kind of like this Venn diagram (laughs) kind of situation. And I was thinking about that last night when I was going to bed, like, the two extremes butting up against each other and, you know, somebody who's used to experiencing that kind of freedom going all the way to the other side. Well, and I had a, I had a, a close friend who said to me, you know, before I went to Beckley he, and he was honest with me, he said, you know, I can't imagine anybody less suited to lose their freedom than you mm-hmm. because I am I mean, in a way, even my conviction in a way was a um, was an attack of lifestyle you know because my lifestyle is not normal i don't you know i've never worked like 9 to 5 mm-hmm. and and i not not because i i just really have proven myself very incapable of being able to do it um and so it's really a shortcoming it's mm-hmm. not a anything else but i always sacrificed some security and money and those things to maintain my freedom Right. Because that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to go run or to go travel or go to a race or go do those things when I wanted to do it. And that was more important to me than having money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so the irony is all the more, (laughs) you know, palpable. Yeah. And I look at, you know what? It's the same reason that just a couple of days I got up 
at five o'clock in the morning to go run around a track in North Carolina for 10 hours mm -hmm. in training and working on my pacing, as I was saying. I did that because I want to, you know, prove to myself, not to anybody else, but that I can do the things that are, are difficult and that I don't want to do and that I know I'll be stronger if I can do it. Mm -hmm. And prison forced me to face that, you know, a thousand times over. Well, yeah, and it's a way of sort of staying connected to that experience, right? It's sort of like the the homeless guy who's given a bed and still sleeps on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, you almost don't want to get too comfortable. And mm -hmm. I, I will say it's, a, you know, I'm, I don't I ever like to be a fear monger, but I never imagined something like that could have ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. And most people can't. You know, mm -hmm. most people don't go through li their lives thinking, oh, man, at any time I could be arrested and go <laughs> yeah. to prison, mm -hmm. you know, and and yet, uh, and not to get off on another big tangent, you know, you look at all the stuff going on with Edward Snowden and just the, you know, all the things being disclosed now. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting place we live in these days where there's very little privacy there's mm -hmm. there's very little that's not suspect and somehow we've become afraid of our own shadows and that somehow justifies that you know n that nothing should be private any longer it's a very bizarre <laughs> mashup because on the one hand we've never had more access to more information so there's a level of transparency that you would think would translate into you know sort of greater sovereign, personal sovereignty, et cetera. And yet at the same time, we have this clampdown kind of happening or this consolidation of governmental power that we're all kind of signing off on willingly, kind of volunteering for it. And in a, in a very Orwellian kind mm -hmm. of sense, you know, that we, we, you know, people say, well, the NSA can, you know, access your iPhone and it can turn on your camera and, and the microphone and <laughs> listen to you. And everyone's like, Okay. All right. So, you know, what are we doing tonight? You know, like we're just sort of yawning over this whole thing. <laughs> and well, I think uh, we feel powerless. Yeah. yeah you know, it's you, like, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, I guess I'll enjoy my day or I'm you not know. gonna give up my iPhone. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Know. Forget about that. <laughs> yeah. Well and it is, you know, we laugh uh, about it, but it is a it's a question that I think I mean I'm I'm sort of enjoying watching it in the media because it's become you know, it's become a really hotly debated topic as it should mm -hmm. be. You know, and I don't, I don't have the answers and I consider myself to be, I consider myself to be a true patriot. I mean, I am a patriot. I, I certainly believe in all the, all the basis of what this country was built on and its freedoms. And, and I think it's very debatable that we even resemble any of that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, vision that our that our forefathers had, you know, these days. And, and some of that is inevitable change that's come through growth and technology and, and other ways. But, but some of it's a, 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 you know, a psychological shift that we're just comfortable mm -hmm. and we're just kind of okay with the stuff that, that we feel powerless to control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have the answers either, I but, either. I, but I know that, I know that, you know, asking the questions and continuing to talk about it is really important. I think people mm -hmm. are, are a little fed up and, and, and worried though, you know, about, about where the direction it's all heading. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad we should be worried, mm -hmm. but we're not, we're not sort of rallying in the streets like Vietnam era. No, you know, we're too distracted. We're too busy for we're that. Too, well, we're busy, but we're, we're busy doing what? We're busy yeah. distracting ourselves with, you know, technology and convenience. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, disposable content. And running. <laughs> and run, well, I'll just running, running very do I? good, yeah. <laughs> no, well, it's, we've been going for almost two hours. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but we do. I do want to say, you know, sort of, you know, in the wake of getting out of Beckley, it was a, a mere year later where you show up at Badwater, right? And, uh, I mean, what were your expectations kind of returning to that race? You know, I wanted to be under the radar, like as much as I possibly could be, uh, which is, you know, at that point was not, not, being not possible. Yeah, especially at Badwater. <laughs> right. I mean, but, but Chris Gossman, the race director who, who I consider a friend and a great guy and he lives and, down the street here. Oh, I yeah, saw that's him right. at the supermarket the other day. Yeah, 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 in the canyon there. And and actually the, you know, we don't have time to talk about it today, but everybody out there should should Google Badwater right now and the right. national parks and all well, that I stuff. Well, I tweeted about that. I mean, I'm sure you saw that article about the um, 
the radiation and that caused a yeah. big reaction with people because uh, you know it's kind of a suspect story but there is, you know basically there's not going to be any adventure core racing in death valley death next National year they have their Park. permits yeah. Yeah. uh were not yeah rubber stamped and it's for the crazy first time it's crazy. I mean, the economic impact alone in Death Valley, you know, is is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And the the tourism, I think, that tangentially comes from the notoriety that a race like Badwater yeah. has. I mean, it brings people from all over the world yeah, to Death Valley. they have to see this place. Yeah, so it's going to I gonna mean, do you have any behind-the-scenes knowledge I, about that that you can impart or not? I really don't, although that I know that every summer there's a lot of Germans around in Death Valley. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it always fascinates what? me. <laughs> they're, in de- they're in Badwater. I don't know if you noticed this. You're, well, you're all the kids that work Germans. in the restaurants in the hotels yeah. are all from yeah. strange foreign countries yeah. doing their like year abroad. And I'm like, yeah. you got sent here? Right. You came to, a, this yeah. is your American experience? Like yeah. <laughs> stuck in the middle of the desert at age 19. You yeah. know, like what do yeah. you guys do all day when you're not working? Well, it's a, you know, and Badwater is a, a great race for a lot of reasons. It's certainly a very difficult race, but it is like, like most big ultras it's a family you know mm-hmm. you go to western states you go to you know leadville any of these you tend to see the same people generally over and over and it's this big celebration really of something difficult and interesting and beautiful mm-hmm. and and for no reason that's been taken away for this year i mean literally for no reason mm-hmm. and hopefully people will you know at least write to the right appropriate people and and complain but anyway to my race this past year i went there chris gave me the race number two mm-hmm. like he assigned me number two and, and usually race numbers are assigned based on previous your year's previous finish. year's finish yeah. so obviously that wasn't the case for me so i don't actually know this but i assume whoever was second the year before didn't mm-hmm. didn't come you know last year otherwise they would have been assigned number two so whoever that was didn't didn't make it um, in the last year. So he gave me number two, which to me instantly put like tons of extra pressure. Uh-huh. Like there was some expectation. Uh, and in fact, somebody before the race, I overheard a comment that someone made, a woman made that, you know, that I didn't deserve number two. She didn't know I could hear her. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I was like, I, I will admit to sort of going, mm, uh-huh. okay. But, you know, I really went there with, a, I think, a good conservative plan, and I, I, I went there to win the race, though. Mm-hmm. I would never have said that out loud and never will before a race. But in my mind, that's the mindset that I, I had to have, and I was fortunate enough to, to run a time that, that actually was fast enough to win mm-hmm. a whole lot of the years in the past. Right, and break the Masters record, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually broke it by three hours and, and had a... If there's any such thing as an easy race at Badwater, I certainly had the easiest one I had ever had. I saw you a couple times. You didn't look like it was easy. You didn't look like you didn't look relaxed. Really? You Dang did not it. look relaxed. Dang it! That's yeah. <laughs> but, yeah that, but, but you were killing it the whole time. I was happy to see you up there. Awesome. I remember. What's the? Is it? Um, what's the town where you come in and you get all the ice? Uh, well, there's stovepipe. The, I think it was stovepipe. It yeah. was sto- it was like three in the afternoon when the heat was really yeah, dialed yeah, yeah. in. And yeah. I saw, I saw you. I was getting ice for Dean, and I saw you coming through, and you ran into the bushes to go to the bathroom or something like that, and, and running by, and and I was like, wow, you're really up there, man. And you were you were killing it, but you didn't look like you. It wasn't like you're like smiling and waving. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's it was really hot. Well, my my afternoon. crew and Anastasiana, I was really yeah. just trying to impress. <laughs> I, know, I was really yeah. just trying to impress her. Not, she's laughing. Over <laughs> That's now. the only thing yeah. I was trying to do was to impress her. Uh, so I had to look good. <laughs> right. <laughs> But, you know, the fact is I do, my crew always knows that I actually, I joke the whole time and I, even if I'm miserable, I do enjoy the experience tremendously and I Mm -hmm. like being out there. But this year, I don't know, two things happened, I think, that that made me have a great race. Maybe maybe three if I just count uh, having an awesome girlfriend at the time, but... um, she taught me how to hydrate properly, which is sounds mm-hmm. sounds like a funny thing, but yeah, for a uh, guy who the guy who ran across the Sahara Desert yeah. needs to be told how to hydrate. Well, I used to show up in Death Valley every year, and I'd I'd maybe start drinking extra water a few days before, and certainly when I got out into that dryness and hotness, I'd ramp it up. The fact is, the what I figured out was my dehydration was chronic, and that mm. you know, as a runner, I, I'm almost. I, I never had done a great job. So a couple months before that race, 
I really, thanks to her, started mm-hmm. focusing on hydration. The other, honestly, is it was the shoes. I actually switched to Hoka's. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, I had run in some fantastic shoe brands before that had supported me well. Newton, mm-hmm. f- most recently. And they're a fantastic brand with great but people. But Newton's the opposite of a, a They Hoka. are. And, yeah. I, and I really, you know, for, for ultra, for someone my size, I'm a little bigger than, mm-hmm. than most of the guys that were up there where I am in the race. And um, Hoka being a fairly new brand, I never had an experience like that in my life. I mean, I, I actually ran the next day after Badwater. Right. And two days later, <clears throat> I ran five miles with wow. no pain. And I'd been in a wheelchair before after, mm-hmm. uh, you know, after Badwater with a variety of other brands. Because it's just a, it's a hard pounding. race. Yeah. yeah, it's a hard race. It's hot and you get dehydrated and, and everything else. So hydration made a difference. And, and again, I would... I would be disingenuous if I didn't admit having something to prove. Mm-hmm. You know, I went there fearful that I would fall apart. I hadn't done the race in a few years. I was 50 years old and I was like going, you know, deep down. I was like, should I really be doing this again? Right. Or should I, you know, I think people expected me just to go out and be, you know, just a participant. Right. And, and I went out and was lucky enough to have a good day and, and race well and have fun doing it and, and actually feel good when it was over. And I've Mm -hmm. never had that experience. Yeah. And I think you surprised a lot of people too. I think there were a lot of people there that didn't expect you to perform at that level. Yeah. And I, I I was probably one of them, but you know, (laughs) I don't don't know. I mean, I, I don't, you know, you, if you go into bad water or any race like that, ever thinking you're going to do a certain thing you're probably going to get your ass handed mm-hmm. to you. So, you know, I, I knew that if I kept a good plan and as always, I was pretty far back in the pack, uh, halfway through and I didn't start going faster. I just maintained mm-hmm. and, and managed to pretty, catch Yeah, you know, the front pack was, was pretty aggressive. They over, were overly aggressive. And usually a few of them will, you know, fall off and that, that happens every mm-hmm. year, you know, they're, they're going after it. And, uh, but it was a great experience. Again, I credit Chris Kosman uh, and the Badwater family for welcoming me back. And there was no, you know, there mm-hmm. was never any discomfort around any of that. And uh, I had a blast. I had a blast. I hope, I hope uh, the 2015, I get to do it again. Yeah. So they're going to do it. They're going to have the quote unquote bad water race. They're just yeah. not going to do it in bad water. Yeah. Right. So Correct. it's going to be out like in the Salton sea area or something like that. Correct. Chris uh-huh. will find a way. Yeah. He'll find a way uh-huh. to make it happen and to make it a good, good event. I mean, he's, you know, he's a brilliant, tough race director yeah. that, that puts on safe, uh, really, really wonderful mm-hmm. events. And, uh, I hope I, I know he'll do the same this year, even, even without death Valley. Speaking of events that go from very low points to very high points, you've been public in talking about this uh, expedition that you've wanted to do going from, uh, what is it, the Dead Sea to the top of Everest. I mean, yeah. are you shelving that for now, or is well, that still on the, the bucket list? It is very much still on the bucket list, mm-hmm. and it's it's something that uh, I would like to do on all seven continents to go from the lowest point on each continent to the highest. And it'll it'll probably if I get to do it, it'll take you know the rest of my life in all likelihood. Um, I've promised uh, that for this year, you know, we'll get through mm-hmm. Run to Boston and and kind of focus on life uh, as much as possible for the rest of the year and on hopefully finishing a book and, and doing those things. But, you know, I love this metaphor of lowest to highest because mm-hmm. I feel like I've, I've been at that lowest point many times. Except and, for you, it's not a, it's, it's not this linear thing. Your, your courses should go, they should, st- they should go high, low, high, low, <laughs> high, low. <laughs> there should be a lot of up and down. Well, if I could put all seven continents yeah. together on the same expedition, that would that would there happen, I guess. But right. I, I absolutely am still that's still on the agenda, and you know, sponsors and finding you know finding companies that uh, and angels out there too that support mm-hmm. the things that I believe in is important to me, and certainly something that. Uh, you know, that I'm always looking for those partnerships and I've been very lucky in the past to find good ones and, and people that believe in what, what I believe in. And I'm confident that will happen again. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Yeah. That sounds like a good place to end it. I so think. now do I get to ask you some questions? Well, yeah. that'll be the next time. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Or we can go running now and you can do <laughs> That'd that. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> If you want it, you should start your own podcast. You, yeah. You're a radio host. You do a podcast. Be, I'll start a network. You can join my All network. All right. That'd be great. Network. I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. I'm sure you know plenty of characters that could I know a few. <laughs> I know a few. I know a few. Cool. All right. So uh, running in place, coming to bookstores probably next year. Yeah. Run to Boston. If people want to support, follow, uh, do you have like a donate? Can people donate? If people want to support this, is there a place for them to go online and learn a little bit more about... Absolutely. Yeah. So just, I mean, it's pretty simple. Run to Boston and, and the, the two is the number two. Mm-hmm. So run to Boston dot com. Uh, because of Andre and I dot com and at run to Boston on mm-hmm. Twitter. We actually just got that handle today. Oh, you did. You know, somebody else. Actually I would imagine it. somebody would. Yeah. Well, but it was just they a guy using it. It was uh, a guy. Uh, it was an Italian guy who ran Boston a few years ago uh, and, 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 you know, he, he had one follower and, and <laughs> didn't ever post true. anything. And so, <laughs> Uh, so we got that and then there's a Facebook page that just went up my first, uh, my first article on the online, the digital version of runnersworld.com. Right. I mean, really runnersworld.com is the best place to to follow it because they're going to not only post the things that I do, but their own stuff. And you know, most runners are there anyway, so Mm -hmm. it's an easy way to follow it. And there will be at least one post a week written by Andre and I mm-hmm. uh, separately. We're telling our own kind of and stories. And you're, you're documenting this on film, are you? Not? Absolutely. You, gotta, you, you Absolutely. have your crew all sorted out for that? And uh, You know, yes, but it's going to be a much lower key affair than certainly not mm-hmm. a running the Sahara and, and not even at this point running running America. It's really just, it might just be me with my handy cam and, right. uh, and out there talking. But... Um, you know, maybe some GoPros attached to some things, but mm-hmm. it's, it, it, you know, this time I certainly want to tell a story, but, um, you know, I'm going to do it more through, through writing and through, you know, the runner's world portal, generally speaking, mm-hmm. just because they've been great about, uh, wanting to help tell the story. Mm-hmm. And obviously they're fully invested in the story of Boston and of, you know, the, the, the purpose behind of Run course. to Boston and and helping to tell an organic uh, story. You know that one doesn't need any embellishment. Right. It's just a it's a it's a poignant story on its own. And so, yeah, it can be Run to Boston dot com or just the Runners World dot com site will always have an update. And mm-hmm. and absolutely, we hope that people will will sign on to receive daily updates. And the one thing about running for forty four days in a row mm-hmm. is there's there's you know, you can ignore a couple of days yeah. and you don't feel like you've missed very much. Are you so. going to have any, like a live <laughs> GPS tracking kind of thing? So Absolutely. People can, okay, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we'll have some mechanism that will, there's a, a couple of possibilities there with some of the apps that are out there right. and, uh, and other ways of doing the tracking. So yeah, people can get on anytime and see where mm-hmm. we are and, Including uh, the NSA. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, they're they're welcome to watch. And so. uh, Robert Nordlander, who Absolutely. will be watching very intently. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, when I left Greensboro, he uh, he apparently took up running. So it was oh, he a did. Thing. Oh, yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. You guys are going to be buddies. We are. We're going to yeah. run run together someday. I fully expect that. Yeah, I would like to see that actually. Cool. Uh, All right. And, uh, if you want to just know a little bit more about Charlie in general, charlieingle.com, right. And yeah. on Twitter at Charlie Ingle, E N G L E. Correct. And, uh, go to richroll.com on the, the page where I'm going to host this episode. I'll put up a bunch of links to some of those news articles like the New York times and outside and the Oxford American one, which is my favorite and other good stuff, including, and the run to Boston site and all that kind of stuff. Great. Cool. Perfect. All right, man. So uh, we'll get you back on the road so you can go enjoy your wedded bliss. Absolutely. But, uh, I'm ready. Thanks again for dropping in. I'm glad it worked out. Thanks, Rich, for having me. I'm, cool, I'm looking man. forward to yeah. uh, to coming back someday. So. Yeah, absolutely. When you're when you when you finish the run and break the record, you got to come back. That's a deal. And then you got to come back again when your book comes out. That's a deal. Happy and, to uh, do it. <clears throat> anything I can do to help with the book stuff too, let me know. Yeah, well, we we figured out we have a lot of problems to solve out oh, there, you do? and I think we can do it. All so, right, good. Yeah. Cool, man. All, All right. right. Best of luck, man. I can't wait Thank to you. Uh, follow you online for this. Thank you. I appreciate cool. it. Thanks. All right, man. Peace. Plants. Yay!